Well, Christians all over the world are waking up to find that the verses in their old familiar Bibles have somehow changed overnight. Of course, I'm talking about the Mandela effect and the supernatural Bible changes. I know, I know it sounds impossible, but a lot of God's people are bearing witness to this very thing. And we're either right or we're delusional. This is not misremembering. But there are no church leaders stepping forward to help us out of our delusion. For seven years, we've been begging pastors to come on our live streams, to give us meetings, talk with us on the phone. It's all to no avail. We're told, I don't have time. This does not merit my time. I've heard that a bunch of times. Or we're just told, this is a deception. You're a heretic. I've heard this a bunch of times. Well, we went to the board with this, and we've judged this as outside of orthodoxy. Uh, you think? So, how about a little uh, good old Samaritan action? I think there's a proverb that says, see those heading for destruction? Oh, hold them back. How about a little of that? <laughs> we can't get anyone to condescend to our miserable plight. I mean, if you're right, we're in a lot of trouble. And my research indicates that there are now millions of Christians making this claim, that their reality is morphing and their Bible's morphing. I mean, doesn't that merit some kind of rescue mission from God's people? Is there no one? Is there not one man of God with a title or letters after his name who has a visible ministry with credentials, with notoriety that will come forward and have compassion on us YouTube Christians, us pseudo-Christians? And certainly me. You've got to put a stop to me because... I'm the ringleader. I'm deceiving people. I'm the charlatan. I'm in it for the money. Have compassion on us, please. Come to our live stream and answer our questions. You can download my 400-page book for free to prepare you to answer our questions. It's at wakeuporelse.com. The book is free. And then the link... Below, we'll have this PowerPoint in a PDF, so you'll have all the questions and this content of this video. And then just come on our live stream and help us. So in this video, I'm going to pose 14 pivotal questions for our Christian leaders to answer regarding the supernatural Bible changes. And these questions are for all Christians to ponder and respond to, but especially the leaders of the Christian world. This is pastors, board members of churches and denominations, C-level executives in Bible publishing houses, Bible college faculty. The professors of the Bible colleges need to contact me at wakeuporelse at proton.me. Have a private conversation with me. Christian influencers and authors and the intelligentsia of the body of Christ. Here are 14 questions that we feel are rational, they're well-researched, and they're theologically based. The first is, where is it written that inspiration equals preservation? This is one of the core tenets of the doctrine of preservation, but it's a guess. It's, some, it's a sentimental assumption. It's very ironic, by the way, the ones that are demanding that we base our Christianity on the sure foundation of Scripture are the same ones that are pressuring us into accepting what amounts to logic and reason to prove that the Bible is preserved. Well, if it's inspired, of course God is going to preserve it. That's a guess, okay? So we want you to admit that inspiration does not equal preservation because it's not taught in the scriptures. Second question, explain why your interpretation of Psalms 12 is correct and almost all commentaries and versions are wrong. Question number three, which is an impasse. There's no possible way any thinking moral Christian could receive these 34 biblical paradoxes into your soul as the inspired word of God. If you can, we're going to love to watch that one. So please provide a brief explanation for these 34 biblical paradoxes that I will present to you. 
Number four, why is Noah spelled Noe and also Noah in the same New Testament? Number five, why did God condone the sacrifice of reptiles? And why is the same word translated differently in the same chapter? That's Leviticus 12.8 in the King James Bible. Why did God command the sacrifice of both male and female sheep in Leviticus? And there's a variety of other questions in and around those two passages, which we will explore on this video. Number seven, explain how all pastors could be confused by misquotes from pop culture. Number eight, explain the catastrophic memory failure that all pastors are exhibiting. That is an undeniable empirical observation. And, and we demand an explanation or what we demand is that you cease and desist from calling us heretics and delusional. Because if you don't have an explanation for these logical, rational questions, then all of your objections are set aside. Number nine, if the Bible can't change, then why has it been changing continuously since inception? Number 10, if God has changed the Bible before, why wouldn't he do it again? Number 11, do the following questions convince you that we are misremembering? And of course, the same line of questions regarding delusion. We're going we're to set aside once and for all the assumption, the argument that this can all be explained away by misremembering. I'm going to do it with about four questions to you, and you will absolutely admit that we're not misremembering. All right, and 13 is our memory quiz. This is different from the catastrophic uh, Bible paradoxes. This is just uh, wildly unfamiliar passages that aren't doctrinal nightmares. And our question surrounding those is why is it that most Christians get most of these wrong and get them wrong the same way? All right, and last question, if all of this doesn't convince you that your doctrine's wrong and the Bible is changing, then what would you need to see in order to believe that the Bible is supernaturally changing? Because we're pretty much at that point where we're, we're worried about you. You're worried about us. But we're really worried, worried about you all. So for seven years now, the majority of our leaders have been silent. They've been evasive, adversarial, and really just seeming to be bewitched. As uh, I, we, many of us believe that the blindness and the unwillingness to, to touch this topic is more of a phenomenon than the phenomenon itself. And we do not seek to divide or bring dishonor to God or his church, but we insist that our testimonies be taken seriously. My message to those that occupy these positions of influence is that the time for ignoring this topic is now over. The reality of this event is about to spill out into the public discourse, and you are going to be forced to pick a side. And we are certainly not confused by misquotes from pop culture or something akin to the telephone game. We're not befuddled by implanted thoughts or confabulation. These are not logical fallacies that have tripped us up. It's not a solecism or a spoonerism or a semantic satiation. It's certainly not a government psyop. We're not biblically illiterate. I personally don't have any hidden agenda like I'm doing this for the money. I'm giving my book away for free for the love of heaven, so it's not some elaborate publicity stunt to sell books. Uh, my YouTube channel is not monetized, as you can see here on the screen, so I'm not doing this for the views. If my channel was monetized, it would not say apply now. I don't sell anything to my listeners, so I'm not doing this to take advantage of God's people monetarily. In fact, I've lost everything in order to obey God's direct command for me to do this. I love my wife very much, but she told me that she didn't want to be married to me anymore because we were in two different worlds. She left me because of my beliefs, and I begged her not to. So any claims that I'm disqualified because I'm divorced are spurious. I can't be discredited because I lack theological credentials because there is no biblical precedent that requires credentials to speak publicly. In fact, the Bible teaches the opposite. 
1 Corinthians 1.26 reminds us, Hey, did you notice your calling that there's not many wise after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble, not many with credentials? Acts 4.13 pointed out when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled and they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. So according to these two passages, I'm eminently qualified and I'm certainly not a wolf in sheep's clothing or a charlatan simply because you say I am. That's really a, a go-to accusation, it seems like. But if you're going to attempt to brand someone that's in public ministry, I would suggest that you include your evidence of such a claim or you will be guilty of bearing false witness. I'm certainly not preaching heresy simply because I'm challenging your interpretation of the doctrine of preservation. There are large tracts of Orthodox Christendom that have held that the Bible does not clearly teach preservation of the scriptures for over a century. Suggesting that the Bible is changeable is far from a heresy. So any attempt to discredit me or the character of an untold number of blood-washed souls to try to silence our testimony will fail miserably. You may sway one or two percent to your way of thinking with personal attacks, but <clears throat> by using ungodly manipulation and avoiding our specific questions, all you're going to do is embolden the other 98 percent because they're going to see you for who you really are. So let's get on with it and see if there are any Christians or church leaders that are even capable of being honest and giving us specific answers to specific questions. We haven't found that there are many after seven years. The human memory isn't unreliable. <clears throat> it's actually very reliable, and we demonstrate that in the book, which you can download for free from my website, wakeuporelse.com. Just click that blue button there. We're not confused by supposed misprints in Bibles into somehow thinking that our reality is morphing. you got to be kidding me. Those would have to be some pretty amazing misprints. An untold number of devout believers are not confused by modernizations of the text or because of all the different versions floating around. Many of the changes that we're pointing out are in every version. So you can't be mixed up by different versions if you can't find the supposed good version that you're thinking you is out there. It doesn't exist. We're not confused in any way. And my book proves that unequivocally. So read it or don't read it. But understand this, you are going to have to answer these questions eventually. And if you wait, you will probably have a mutiny on your hands if you're a church leader. Because your followers will ask you, how is it that you couldn't have known this? This is so obvious to us now that you have this, we have this book. And they will then question your integrity and your discernment. And you'll have no way to explain your oversight. They will see you as what you are, the blind leading the blind, or worse, a co-conspirator. And anyone that's determined to continue to just cast aspersions without reading the book, or at least providing some specific answers to our specific questions, in the end will be viewed as nothing more than a hireling, and will be abandoned by the followers that you're trying so desperately to hold on to by ignoring this. Seven years of obfuscation and stonewalling by church leaders has left us no choice but to speak as plainly as I am right now. We have no hidden agenda except a zeal for God's house and a burden for God's people. So it's God that has sent this storm into the church, dear soul, not me. I'm just being obedient by reporting on what he's already doing. This is not an attack on the scriptures. It is a reformation <clears throat> that cannot be stopped because the Bible is being overemphasized in the life of many believers. It is being used in a way that it was never meant to be used. And although this will be a disruptive event, only good will come from this redemptive judgment. God is sending a Tower of Babel intervention into his church in this hour to get our attention and show many of us 
how we have mistakenly embraced a miracle-free, intellectual type of a Christian walk instead of a visceral, prophetic heart relationship. God is asking all of us, do you know me or do you just know the book? Do you know me, my child, or do you just know my book? This will be the greatest thing to ever happen to your walk with God, as it is for many of us. All of our claims that this is happening are backed by the authority of Scripture. So please read the book before you decide that this is just foolishness to be ignored. And if your leader tells you that, I would suggest that you ignore his advice and read the book so you can decide for yourself. As I said, you can download the book at wakeuporelse.com. So let's begin. Our first question is, where is it written that inspiration equals preservation? Because if you listen to scholars teach on this topic, what you will learn is that the DOP, as I call it, the Doctrine of Preservation, has two parts to it. The first part is a loosely held variety of assumptions which are impossible to substantiate. The goal of these assumptions is to convince the hearer that what we have today in our Bibles is identical to the original autographs. Now, of course, this is impossible to know because the full copies that we have for many of the New Testament books were not penned for decades or even centuries after the originals were penned. So there is no way to know for sure that what we have today is identical to the originals. And that is an orthodox position to take. Also, the argument that we have now, what we have now is identical to the originals is not a promise that God would not remove his word as a judgment as he has done many times before. These are two different arguments. However, the DOP is at the centerpiece of the Bible can't change narrative. So to support this idea, this first part of the DOP narrative uses concepts like theological necessity, which relies on logic and reason to come to its conclusions. And you're entitled to assume things about God if you like, but it certainly doesn't make me a heretic if I require chapter and verse instead of conjecture in order to formulate my theological positions, thank you very much. Demanding a closer examination of the DOP and its terminology is an example of how the Mandel Effect community is actually more orthodox than those calling us heretics. Theological necessity breathlessly asserts that it doesn't make any sense that God would go to all this trouble to give us the Bible if he wasn't going to preserve it. Well, that's a sentimental assumption. It's a tradition of men, not clearly defined decree by the Creator. We are also told things like, well, if God inspired his word, then of course it only makes sense that he would preserve it. Okay, well, that's fine, you know, if you want to believe that. But theological necessity is a guess. It is a guess that is presented to the church as doctrine, and I am taking issue with that in the light of this event. God is messing with your theology, not me. God is the one stepping into your theology, and he is dismantling it like the Tower of Babel. Because if your theology was correct, God wouldn't be doing what he's doing. God wouldn't allow himself to do it because of his own theology. But your theology is incorrect. The idea that because the Bible is inspired, therefore it's preserved, is nothing more than wishful thinking. The idea is not taught anywhere in the Bible. It's just SMU, stuff made up. And so this brings us to this first question. Where is it written that inspiration equals preservation? Because that is the centerpiece argument of the DOP, at least the first pillar of it. The second pillar is the preservation promises, which I'll get to in a second. So since I know that it isn't written anywhere, I would like to point out that Every time someone barks at me that the Bible can't change in a condescending tone 
what I'd like to point out is that they will be relying on this galactic guess to some degree. Okay, all of that certainty that they feel about the Bible having a force field around it, at least to some degree, is based on nothing but puffery. I'm sorry, but it isn't a doctrine if you're prefacing your position with statements like, well, it only makes sense that, or it only seems logical that. All of that certainty that people are relying on is based on a guess, not the sure foundation of Scripture. And as I mentioned, isn't it ironic that the same people that keep bashing us over the head with the idea that we have to base everything we believe on the sure foundation of Scripture are the same people that are pressuring us into accepting something that is not based on the Scripture? Okay? If, if logic is the basis for the conviction that God will preserve the Scriptures, then <clears throat> I can just as easily use logic to suggest that he will not preserve the Scriptures. Okay? It's just as plausible that he isn't going to preserve the Scriptures because we've allowed the Bible to become an idol. How about that possibility? How about the Church acknowledges my new doctrine called the Doctrine of Unpreservation? And I actually have more Scripture to support my doctrine than you do. I have over 300 citations in my book. So therefore, I hereby announce the Doctrine of Unpreservation, <clears throat> my free book is 400 pages, and it provides a comprehensive, systematic theology to support my new doctrine. And I just nailed it to the door of Wittenberg Castle Church. It's called wakeuporelse.com. It's right on the front page. The Ten Commandments is doctrine. Theological necessity however, is a tradition of men, and this is what Jesus has to say to you unless you quickly get on the right side of history. Jesus said, making the word of God of none effect through your tradition, which ye have delivered, and many such like things do ye. That's a great example of how the Bible's being changed. The wording is becoming so jagged and angular, it's almost impossible to get out of your mouth. And I do see that from the pulpits of many churches. The pastor is trying to read the scripture and it can't flow like it used to. Anyway, <clears throat> I cover that very beginning of the book. I think there's about 40, 30 different ways the Bible's changing. And so I encourage you to read that. Anyway, this debate has nothing to do with whether or not the devil is powerful enough to do this, or if God is powerful enough to stop the devil. It has to do with whether or not God is going to allow it, which he most certainly is allowing it. Theological necessity is not taught in the Bible. It's just something you've been told from the front of the room in a thousand different ways for your entire life. We've all believed it without really understanding it. I, I certainly didn't. I've been in the ministry for decades, and I never really looked into what the DOP was really teaching until this study. So, I know I'm not different than a lot of people. So now you know the first pillar of this, all this certainty that the Bible can't change is a guess. It is not a doctrine. So stop bashing us over the head with this decree that the Bible can't change. It's cockamamie. It's not, nothing to do with doctrine. Now, the second leg, though, of the DOP is the supposed preservation promises found in the Bible. I cover the top seven preservation scriptures in my book in chapter five, and none of them, I beg, beg forgiveness of you, but none of them promises that the scriptures are preserved. We, we, easily show in a number of different ways that the term scripture and the term word of God are not the same. It is not hard to make that case at all. Therefore, what is being promised is the word of God will be preserved, not the terrestrial words on the pages of a terrestrial book. So once that distinction is made, 
none of these promises mean what they are being held out to me. They're being mishandled. However, Psalms 12, which is the poster child, is not being mishandled. It is being taken out of context, please. So this is our second question, which is explain why our interpretation of Psalms 12 is right and almost all commentaries and versions are wrong. I'm going to really take some time with Psalms 12 because it is the poster child proof text for the DOP. And I can't possibly cover these topics with some two-minute TikTok-style videos. So if this is all too burdensome for you, I suggest that you just keep the link because you're going to need it soon. So my first observation is, wouldn't you agree that it is at least dis intellectually dishonest to call us heretics for simply agreeing with most versions and almost all the commentaries? Because none of the commentaries agree that, that this psalm is a preservation promise. None of them. So the unfortunate reason why Psalms 12 is the most quoted passage to suggest preservation is the wording that you see in verses 6 and 7 provides what appears to be the clearest promise of preservation found anywhere in the scripture. Verse 6, the words of the Lord are pure words as silver tried in a furnace of earth purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord, thou shalt preserve them for this generation forever. I mean, that wording right there is semantically is as close to an exact pres preservation promise as you can get. The fact that it has, doesn't mean that is irrelevant to most church leaders. It's a, this is an outrage. It's so, so astonishing to me as we get into this. You'll, you'll see it clearly doesn't mean that, but they don't care. They're just going to use it anyway. The way these words go together, it sounds so clear. It seems so clear that what the scripture is promising here, isn't it saying that God is promising to preserve his word from this generation forever? No, no, a thousand times no. And the only conclusion I can draw from what I'm seeing throughout the entire body of Christ is that many well-meaning teachers of God's word are playing fast and loose with this passage for a variety of reasons. To say that they want it to be true so that they are just going along with the status quo is to be charitable. This psalm is not hard to understand. It's only eight verses long, and it's completely unambiguous. There's no mystical metaphors or historical references to trip you up. <clears throat> the context is clear, and you don't need a Bible school degree to understand what the psalmist is saying. So why are most Bible teachers coming up with this wrong interpretation of this psalm? Why are most Bible teachers holding this up as a promise from God to put a force field around the terrestrial Bible? Well, you have to read the book to find out the real answer to that. The real answer is fairly complicated, but it's a bombshell, as you'll see if you read the book. However, to find out what the subject of the psalm is, you only have to read verse 1. Which says, help, Lord, for the godly man ceaseth, for the faithful fail from among the children of men. So what is being discussed here in verse 1? What is the topic of this psalm so far? Would you agree that the topic in this psalm so far is the godly man? So what leads you to believe that the subject changes between now and the end of the psalm when you have to decide what verse 7 is referring to? Verse 7 is referring to verse 1. You know it, and I know it. And if you agree with that, then there should be no confusion when you get to verse 7, and you have to decide what verse 7 is referring to. If you admit that, I'm asking you to stop holding the scripture up as a promise from God that he will never let anything happen to your Bible. If you agree with this interpretation, then you need to stop pointing to your Bible and quoting Psalms 12 as a preservation promise. Stop pointing to the Bible and saying, God promised in Psalms 12 that he would preserve his word. No, he didn't. You are promising that he will preserve his word. 
not him. Almost every commentary concludes that verse 7 is referring to verse 1 and verse 5, not verse 6, which we will look at here in a second. Most translations translate it that way as well. So it seems that the only people trying to suggest otherwise are DOP proponents with an agenda. People need to be more concerned with what the Bible teaches than what their denomination has told them to teach for generations. So if you wrongly conclude that verse 7, which is here, thou shalt keep them, O Lord, thou shalt preserve them. Them is what? Is it what's mentioned in verse 6? The words of the Lord are pure. Oh, God will keep the words? No, no. Thou shalt keep them is the godly man and what's mentioned in verse 5, as we'll see. Taken out of context, it's a doozy. It's a perfect uh, couple of words to, to push this narrative. But unfortunately, most Bible teachers seem to be like a determined detective who keeps the suspect under a bare bulb interrogation until they crack and provide a confession. They know the confession isn't true, but they don't care. All they want is to be able to get the suspect to say the words they need to secure a conviction. Psalms 12 has been pummeled into submission by DOP proponents with whiteboards and an adamant tone in their voice. It's a lie of convenience, and one only has to listen to the preserved word teachers unpack Psalms 12 to understand that they are willfully ignorant, if not bold-faced lying. Psalms 12 is being pawned off on innocent truth seekers as a preservation promise, and it's an outrage. The, the lengths that I have seen Bible teachers go to in an effort to force Psalms 12 into the preservation category has been astonishing. This includes pastors, PhD level theologians, Bible school professors, and the like. It is so universally mishandled that I fear that there is a conspiracy to, to, to deceive God's people. It is so obviously not a preservation promise that I have no other explanation for why so many are providing such a ridiculous interpretation. This psalm is simple. So let's just slow down and look at it verse by verse in layman's terms without resorting to the most advanced hermeneutical gymnastics in an attempt to get this poor little psalm to say something that it was never meant to say. So verse 1 Help, Lord, for the godly man ceaseth, for the faithful fail from among the children of men. All right, so would you agree that the psalmist here is appealing to God for help? And he's pointing out that so few are faithful, almost to be reminding God that the godly man has earned the covenant promises of God by remaining faithful. That's what we do with God. He says, come. Let us reason together. And so we go before God and we put him in remembrance of his word. That's what this psalm is just doing in verse 1. Hey, God, the faithful fail from among the children of men. We're, we're taking it on the chin here, God, but we're the faithful ones. Remember? Remember your promise? Okay, that's verse 1. Verse 2, the psalmist switches his focus now. Let me read it first. Verse 2, they speak vanity, everyone with his neighbor, with flattering lips, and with a double heart did they speak. Okay, so now he's switched the focus. It's no longer the godly man. The psalmist switches his focus to the ungodly and begins to point out the characteristics of the ungodly. This psalm is a petition to heaven for aid, and verse 2 is the psalmist's attempt to build a case with heaven by providing a contrast between the godly and the ungodly. So he starts out re reminding God that the faithful are, are really taking it on the chin. And then he reminds God, those ungodly folks, this is what they're doing over here. Then verse 3 says, The Lord shall cut off all flattering lips and the tongue that speaketh proud things. In verse 3, the psalmist seems to switch from addressing God to proclaiming the nature of God, but he is still petitioning heaven. He is simply putting God in remembrance of his word and is reminding God that, generally speaking, 
God preserves people that honor him and punishes those that don't. Let me read verse 3 again. The Lord shall cut off all flattering lips, the ones that he just mentioned in verse 2, and the tongue that speaketh proud things. He's talking to God, but he's declaring God. That's how we pray. We come before God boldly to receive mercy in a time of need. And we proclaim his word. And we proclaim the word of God so that the angels will be invoked. Bless the Lord, all you his angels who excel in strength, who hearken unto the word of the Lord. Verse 4 is the same as verse 3. He, it says, Who have said with our tongue will we prevail? Our lips are our own. Who is Lord over us? He's He's reminding God what the ungodly are like. In an effort to get God to come to his aid, or perhaps he's seeking intercession for others. He's providing a contrast between the godly and the ungodly in an effort to secure God's intervention on behalf of himself and possibly all godly as a form of intercession. All right, now we get to verse 5. And it says, for the oppression of the poor and the sighing of the needy, now will I arise, saith the Lord. I will set him in safety from him that puffeth at him. Well, this verse is now different from the others in that now we have a direct prophetic utterance from God himself. It's almost as if verse 5 is God providing an answer to the petitions that have been offered in verses 1 through 4. The direct decree of God in this verse is, yes, I agree. I will do as you have petitioned. God says, because the ungodly have oppressed the poor, and because my godly ones have cried out to me, I will set him in safety. Let me read it again. For the oppression of the poor, for the sighing of the needy, now will I arise, saith the Lord. This is God's decree. This is God's answer within the psalm to the psalmist. And he says, I will set him in safety from him that puffeth at him. That statement right there is what verse 7 is referring to. That promise, I'm sorry, verse 6. Verse 6, the words of the Lord are pure. You can count on them. What was said in verse 5, dear soul, that promise that God will preserve the godly is what verse 6 is promising you will come to pass. It's as sure as silver that's tried in the fire. Thou will keep them, those godly ones, Lord. So when we get to verse 6, the psalmist introduces an analogy that involves both verses 6 and 7 and is designed to highlight the certainty of God following through on the prophecy that came through the psalmist in verse 5. God said that he would do what the psalmist requested, and now the psalmist is letting the reader know that you can take that promise to the bank, baby. Verse 6 and 7 is like when a trusted friend tells you, hey, this is me talking. I guarantee you what I'm telling you is true. So silver that is freed from its contaminants will not be able to be confused with fake silver. And the psalmist says that this promise that you read in verse 5, I will set him, the godly man, in safety from him that puffeth at him, the ungodly, that promise is likened to the pure words, it's called, or the purity of silver, which is not fake. That pure silver that has that distinctive twing when you put it on the table, when you drop it, on the table and it makes that sound in the same way God's promise is made of pure words the psalmist is assuring the reader that the promise that God gave in verse 5 will come to pass the promise of verse 5 is not a promise to preserve the written text the scrolls the law and the prophets or any such thing that idea is nowhere in the psalm verse 7 when the psalmist utters this promise of, of verse 7 that God will keep them it is clear that he is referring to the godly person, the needy, the oppressed person, not your King James Bible in English. Now, I invite the most learned, credentialed theologian to ever walk upon the flat, stationary earth to show me how my interpretation of this psalm is incorrect. 
show us how this is somehow being twisted by me. And this is, in fact, a preservation promise. Now, I know what you would have to do in order to do that. So let me front run anybody that will actually take this challenge. You will be forced to because I've watched this happen. I've watched people pummel this poor little psalm into submission until both the psalm and the poor souls listening to you are forced to nod in agreement. So you will begin by disparaging me personally, every time, by, by suggesting that I'm unqualified and that this type of analysis should be reserved for only elite scholars with appropriate credentials like you have. You will ask me, do you speak Hebrew like I do? And then something to the effect that how dare you take the word of God in your mouth and recklessly go on leading people astray without receiving the proper education first. This is designed to lead your followers into, yeah, yeah, he's right. Yeah, yeah this guy's uh, uncredentialed. Yeah, we, we, probably what he's saying isn't true. You will suggest that it is my lack of proper education that has caused me to misrepresent this psalm. Your listeners then get the same message and they're then convinced that even though what I'm saying seems completely rational and they agree with it, they, they just somehow are able to assume that they must have been mistaken and uh, they just follow the guy with the decree, the degrees after his name. And they're convinced that because they don't have credentials themselves, that their common sense and their discernment should be set aside and they will assume that even though my interpretation seems like the obvious truth, they will reject that based on the idea that their the real interpretation is just hidden from them because they the real meaning is so complicated that only the elite can see it. The clear testimony of Scripture is set aside for some obscure, mind-bending, hermeneutical extravaganza that most people don't even agree with, but they surrender to it anyway because they can't bring themselves to accept that the guy that they have followed for 20 years is a liar. You will then launch into a lofty, deep-dive juggernaut into the original meanings of the Hebrew text that will make most people's eyes roll back in their heads. And you do this on purpose to communicate the very clear message that you and you alone are the keeper of the flame. Just like the Catholic priests that told the faithful they were not to read the Bible and only the priest could properly read and interpret the Holy Scriptures. You have Charles Taze Russell, who is the founder of the Watchtower Society, who wrote commentaries on his own heretical version of the Bible, the New World Translation. It denied every major doctrine, the doctrine of hell, the doctrine of the person of the Holy Spirit, the doctrine of the deity of Christ, you name it. But then he wrote commentaries about his heretical Bible entitled Studies in the Scripture. And in that, Volume 1, called The Divine Plan of the Ages, old Chuck, Chucky, states this, if anyone has been in the light of the studies in Scripture and then stops reading them, he will go back into darkness from which he came. So the Catholic priests, Charles Taze Russell, and many leaders today have been and are inculcating the faithful into a dependence on an elite class from time immemorial. Now, don't take my word for it. Here are the commentaries on this passage and what they concluded. Well, first you have the different versions. The, the NIV agrees with us. You, Lord, will keep the needy, not the them. New Living Translation, therefore, Lord, we know you will protect the oppressed. Berean Standard Bible, you, O oh Lord, will keep us. Okay, but um, here are the commentaries. Benson commentary. That will preserve them. That will keep him, that is, thy poor and lowly servant. Benson commentary clearly takes the position that Psalms 12 is not a preservation promise. 
for the scriptures, it is a preservation promise for the godly man. Matthew Henry agrees as well. God will secure his chosen remnant. But all God's people are put into his hands. Barnes notes on the Bible, thou shalt keep them, that is, the persons referred to in Psalms 12.5. Gill's exposition, thou shalt keep them, O Lord, not the words before mentioned as Abdon Ezra explains it, but the sense is that God will keep the poor and needy. Cambridge Bible, the first, thou, is emphatic, them, refers to the poor and needy. Pulpit commentary is the same. Okay, so, number of translations and most of the commentaries agree. And even if I concede that you are correct about Psalms 12, you would still be incorrect. Uh, because even if verse 7 is promising that God will preserve his word, it does not tell you where he will preserve his word. So DOP proponents just assume when God is promising to preserve his word that it means he will do it on paper. But all you have to do to find out where he's actually going to preserve it is go to Malachi 3.3 and find out that he's going to preserve it in the hearts of men and women. Malachi 3.3, he will sit as a refiner and a purifier of silver. He will purify the sons of Levi and purge them as gold and silver that they may offer to the Lord an offering in righteousness. So the silver that God will purify in Psalms 12 is the heart of men. He's going to preserve his word in the hearts of men in this post-canonized scripture church era, not the pages of the Bible. So I think it's fair to suggest that we are avoiding the heretic category if we're claiming that at least Psalms 12 does not teach the Bible can't change. Now, you may disagree with me. I found this to be very prevalent. If, if people disagree with your interpretation, they are then branded as heretics and deceivers. <laughs> okay, now if I got almost all the commentaries and many of the translations on my side and you take the other side, please don't call me a heretic. Please. Psalms 12 provides zero protection from the Mandela effect. And I have a whole chapter devoted to breaking down the other main preservation promises in my book, um, <clears throat> which is chapter 5. And uh, you'll find that none of them even come close to promising that the scriptures won't change. So all preservation promises are promising that his word will be preserved. And of course, the other leg of the doctrine of preservation is a guess. So based on that, the, the, the whole narrative that the Bible can't change just collapsed before you for the most part. Okay, and as I said, this is no TikTok video. I do plan to be here for a while. You may need to take this in chunks, but this to me is the most important event in the entire church age next to Jesus coming on the scene. So I don't plan to, um, you know, jump on and jump off here. This is number three. This is the this is the big kahuna, right? <laughs> this is gonna be, this is gonna be where a lot of people come over. This is gonna be where anybody that could be one will be one. So if you have the Holy Spirit of God on the inside of you, I don't see how you'll be able to absorb the following biblical paradoxes into your soul as the inspired word of God. And we just want our leaders to make sense of what appears to be blasphemy, salacious innuendo, ungodly themes that are very unlike the God that many devout believers have walked with all of their lives or most of their lives. Please don't talk down to us when, when you do respond to these like we're some boobs. I have people with PhDs in theology on my side that have written books about this, with four theological degrees and 12 theological books. So that kind of behavior is not going to be tolerated by God much longer. This arrogant, condescending tone in responding to this is a violation of Matthew 5, not to call your brother a fool. So stow the insults, please, and show us how we're deceived. Because all the bravado and the vitriol 
that we have endured simply reveals a weakness in your argument. You have no answer, so you have to resort to manipulation to try to eliminate the threat with brute force. Well, guess what? God is about to unleash a little brute force of his own in the form of a massive advertising budget that is going to blast my free book into the hands of all of your followers, including your donors. And the Christians in the Mandela Effect community have tried to reason with church leaders for seven years to no avail. So now God has commissioned me to go around you, according to Matthew 18. You're all supposed to be the ones that are so exalted in your understanding. Well, let's see it. Explain why it is when I show these paradoxes to any Christian that knows their Bible. That the ones that don't have any kind of leadership role, that all of them, without exception, are visibly shaken. While it's like the first time that they've ever seen most of these and they also are shocked that these passages don't seem to jive with who they know God to be. So these are not only wildly unfamiliar, they're also unlike God. However, when I show it to church leaders, uh, I get a different response. They typically will rise up like an ornery rattlesnake and they'll show me the door. So we'd like to know why this is happening. Why is it happening to us? If this is the inspired word of God, why can't we all just sing Kumbaya? Why are you attacking us instead of leading us out of our deception? Why don't you answer our questions? Why aren't you shocked and horrified like everyone else? None of the examples that I'm about to show you can be explained by misprints. They're not caused by modernizations and we're not confusing them with other versions. Let me tell you how you can know that is true. All of these alternate explanations, the universal ones. I also have some King James ones, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you, I think about 22 of them are universal. They all have one thing in common, but especially those. They're in every Bible, in every century. Okay, the universal ones are all in King James and all the versions. So they're in the 1611. They're in every revision, including the 1769 Oxford. And every King James Bible that you can get your hands on in any form on any bookshelf in any century, including Grandma's Gutenberg in the attic. So how can it be a modernization? In order for it to be a modernization, it has to be different than what's in the 1611, and these aren't. Everything that I'm about to show you is in the 1611 and the Bible on your coffee table, and, and every Bible that you could go out and find anywhere. So this this idea that there's some reputable Bible, the one that you expect the words to be different in, doesn't exist. I have purposely made certain of that. And the same is true with the idea that we're confused by rogue versions. You can't find a main version that has different rendering of this passage. There's no rogue version somewhere. Besides, what I'm showing you is in your own familiar Bible. What do you think happens? Does someone switch your personal Bible when you weren't looking? <laughs> I mean, come on, man. Think. What I'm about to show you is in your Bible. And the Bible that doesn't have these atrocities in them doesn't exist. So I've painted you into a corner. There is no logical escape. There is no rational explanation for what I'm about to show you. These are everywhere. They're in every century. They're in every commentary. And if they are, the, if it's the first time you're seeing them and they're shocking to you, then you have to drop to your knees and you have to say, God, how is this possible? Who are you, God? Who are you that you would send such a judgment on your people? Stop denying the faculties that God has blessed you with, with certainty with discernment, with intuition, with intellect. All of these are you, are, you are commanded to remember eight times in the Bible. Commanded by God eight different times to remember. God would not command you to do something that you are incapable of doing, dear soul.
So we have found that there are anomalies within this anomaly as well. Very rare cases, you may have a King James or, um, or some other hard copy version that is different from all the other Bibles in that same version. Now we've seen that, so we give place to that. And so there may be some obscure version as well that virtually no one looks at that might be different, but these changes are pretty much everywhere. Okay, so the same is true with, with a misprint. In order for it to be a misprint to explain all of this, you'd have to be able to find the version that wasn't misprinted or you can't use that argument. It's out the window. And you can't find the word version that isn't misprinted. So these aren't misprints, okay? What you're about to see is proof that the Bible is being supernaturally changed. Here we go. Okay, remember now, these biblical paradoxes that I'm going to give you are in King James and all the major translations. There's no way that it could be caused by a modernization. We're not confused by other versions because it's in every version. The other thing you have to be mindful of is if I'm reading things to you and it's the first time it's ever come to your attention, you have to calculate the probability of that. 2 Kings 18.27 but Rabshakeh said unto him, Hath my master sent me to thy master and to thee to speak these words? Hath he not sent me to the men which sit on the wall that they may eat their own dung and drink their own piss with you? I'd like to point out in the second sentence in the, towards the end where it says, speak these words. There's a question mark and then the next word is not capitalized. That is all through the King James Bible. Punctuation errors and vulgarity, and I'm telling you, after 40 years, if I knew there was any passage that talked about drinking your own piss, now that is in the 1611, dear soul. Drinking your own piss and eating your own dung is in your 1611 and your 1769. It's in your Bible. It's in every Bible. There is no vi version <laughs> of any Bible that doesn't say this. You might find some. Very, very, very obscure versions. We've also seen anomalies within the anomaly where you can have the exact same King James version, two different Bibles, and they aren't the same. So this is very, very difficult to navigate. All right, so next one, Luke 19, 27. But those mine enemies, which would not that I should reign over them, bring hither and slay them before me. That's Jesus. I know. You want to suggest, well, this is a parable. Well, I'm asking you to have integrity here. Did you know that was in your Bible? Because my experience being a content creator is everywhere I go, when I say that scripture, everyone's shocked. They say, what do you mean? What Bible version are you? That's not in my Bible. I just did an interview with, and, and the video got 17,000 views and I think about 95% were, were shocked by that. Everybody was like, this is unbelievable. So how could that be happening if what we're saying has, doesn't have some validity? Isaiah engaging in fornication with a prophetess. Isaiah 8.3 Then I made love to the prophetess and she conceived and gave birth to a son and the Lord said to me, Name him Marhar, I can't even say this, Marhar Shalhashbaz, whatever. Uh, no, okay, because later Isaiah is rebuking adulterers, and the Bible, you know, some people have tried to suggest that this was his wife, but the Bible doesn't teach that. And try it for yourself. Go ask some pastors. Hey, pastor, in your, uh, in your memory, did Isaiah ever knock up a prophetess? Well, no, John, I don't believe I remember that. Let's go on from here. He knocked up the prophetess. I'm sorry. Exodus 12, 23 is a huge biblical paradox, and it's wildly unfamiliar. I went to church last Sunday, and the Baptist pastor said it out of his mouth from the pulpit, from memory. He invoked the death angel as in his talk. The death angel does not appear anywhere in your King James Bible or any Bible in any century. That's Exodus 20, 23. Jesus spitting in people's faces is Mark 8, 23. Leviticus 4, 32, you have God 
giving direction to sacrifice female sheep. And in the same book, he gives direction to sacrifice male sheep. I think that's in Leviticus 1 and also Exodus. So you have to sort that out. 2 Corinthians 11.8, Paul is robbing churches. Isaiah 60.16, you have people sucking the breasts of kings. Now, I, I understand that you can back out of this. There's always a backstory. There's always a commentary. And what it's really saying is that the royalty will uphold you. Okay, but that's not what the words say. So the translators are either are incompetent perverts or the Bible's changing. Because at a certain point, if you hold that the Bible is perfect and flawless and inspired and received and delivered and authorized, but I keep throwing these up in your face and you're forced to take a fallback position, well, it's a bad translation or it doesn't really mean that, well, then, th then you can't have it both ways. It can't be perfect and flawless, and then allow me to say, get you to say 36 times that it's a bad translation. You see the problem that you have? All right, Zechariah 5, 9, female angels. Doesn't say they're angels, but it's women with wings. I'm here to tell you, if that was in my Bible, how did I go 40 years and never know there was women with wings uh, lifting up the ephah? All right, Psalms 137. I know this is, you could try to claim this is imprecatory prayer, whatever. They're smashing babies against the rocks, makes you happy. That's Psalms 137, verse 9. Luke 18, 15, Jesus is touching babies. Ezekiel 23, 20. Uh, there she lusted after her lovers, whose genitals were like those of donkeys and whose emissions was like that of horses. See, what I found is very common is is people will come back to me with one example and they will either say, I remember this was in my Bible. And that's their final position. Like, like one memory that they have discounts 34 biblical paradoxes and another 30 unfamiliar verses that millions of Christians are freaking out about. So this idea that you can land on one thing and then, and then just delete the entire topic is preposterous. Okay, and we want an explanation for why you have patriarchs like, um, who is this, Joseph, Jacob, uh, he's practicing divination. Leviticus 19.26 says, you shall not eat anything with its blood, you shall not practice divination or soothsaying. Genesis 30.27, but Laban said to him, if I have found favor with you, stay. I have learned by divination that the Lord has blessed me because of you. False teachers are to be tolerated, according to 2 Corinthians 11.4. Again, I'm not going to read them all. You'll have to check them out for yourself. And then Mark 14.51, you've got um, people streaking in the New Testament. This young man laid hold of him and he left the linen cloth and fled from them naked. And then John 21.7, you've got uh, Peter running around naked as well. Okay, now those are all, those are in basically every Bible, every translation. So it's not a modernization. And it's not a translation confusion. You can just get that out of your head. Those are not options. I have closed that door for you. So now you have to say, well, if it's not those two things, and any of those blew your hair back, you're going to have to figure out how those escaped you your entire Christian life. And then you're going to have to figure out how you reconcile that as being the inspired word of God. If you're able to do that, I would just wish you the best of luck. Okay, now I'm going to give you um, some more that are also universal. And this is, um, this is, again, another form of change. Most believers remember some a few passages that spoke about cannibalism during a uh, during a judgment where people were eating their own children or whatever but now there's nine versions nine different references to this but some of them are really really weird so i'm going to read a couple of these because they're multiplying so there's passages that are obscure that are now multiplying instead of it being once it's nine or ten or fifteen times and 2 Kings 6, 28 really jumped out at me. Give up your son so we may eat him today, and tomorrow we'll eat my son. 
So we cooked my son and ate him. The next day I said to her, Give up your son, so we may eat him. But she had hidden him. There's a lot of eating, people eating each other in the Bible now. Um, Jeremiah 19.9, I will make them eat the flesh of their sons and daughters, and they will eat one another's flesh, because their enemies will press the sea so hard. Ezekiel 5.10, Therefore, in your midst, fathers will eat their children, and children will eat their fathers. I don't even know how you do that. Because if the father ate the children, how is the children turning around and eating their father? He just got eaten. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry, but this is outrageous. Micah 3, 2. You who hate good and love evil, who tear the skin from my people and the flesh from their bones, who eat my people's flesh and strip off their skin and break their bones in pieces, who chop them up like meat for the pan. This is not familiar to a lot of Christians. And it's really creepy. I don't say there's obscure things and there's horrible things and there's all kinds of things in the Bible, but this is this is different. Isaiah 9, 19. On thy right, they will devour, but still be hungry. On the left, they will eat, but not be satisfied. So you got to understand the elite are all up and down on some, um, they're pedivores, right? So all of these themes... LBGT theme, you've got 16 references to men kissing each other now in the, in the New Testament and Old Testament. Now, I remember 1 Timothy, whatever, people fell on their neck and kissed him, but I, I definitely don't remember 15 or 16 references to people kissing one another. <sighs> Genesis 29, and it came to pass, and Laban heard the tidings of Jacob, and his sister's son, and he ran to meet him and embraced him and kissed him. Esau ran to meet him and fell on his neck and kissed him. Genesis 27, 26, and his father Isaac said unto him, Come near and kiss me. Genesis 45, moreover, he kissed all his brethren. Genesis 48, 10, and he kissed them. Exodus 4, and the Lord said to Aaron, Go into the wilderness to meet Moses. And he went and met him in the mountain of God and kissed him. Moses and Aaron are kissing. Samuel's kissing. David's kissing. Everybody's kissing. Okay, so we're just going to move on from the kissing. I think you get my point. Uh, you have to read the book. There's a, a, a mountain of, of uh, these types of evidences. Uh, and you've got these kind of weird things in Acts 28, 15. And from thence, when the brethren heard of us, they came to meet us as far as Appy Forum and the three taverns. Sounds like Paul was stopping to tilt a few on the way to Nazareth or whatever. All right, now here's some biblical paradoxes. Those are all universal. These are only found in the King James. Uh, so they're um, a little more shocking. Some of these, of course, sacrificing turtles, Leviticus 12.8, nursing fathers. This is another LBGT theme. Isaiah 49, 23. This one I'm going to land on for a second. Hebrews 6, 1 in the KJV. Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on to perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance. The context in the message of Hebrews 6 is very clear. Let's move on from the basics, and we're going to go on to Maturity and the more advanced things. We're leaving the elementary principles of the doctrine of Christ. Well, the Mandela effect, supernatural Bible changes, it's come in and it's removed the word elementary out of your text. So now what you have is a passage that tells you to ignore Jesus from here on in. This is what it says. Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ. Selah. If I'm a bad actor, I could take this and run with it. Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on to perfection. Yes, like to Satanism and to a one world religion. Let's leave Jesus in the dust and move on to the one world religion. All right, Luke 17, 34, you've got two men in a bed and, and two women grinding. Grinding is a euphemism for sex in Job 31, 10. And I've watched two pastors now in the pulpit come across this 
and were visibly shaken, which to me meant that it was the first time it ever came to attention. And they felt compelled to provide a disclaimer to their followers because the innuendo here is so strong that they felt compelled to say, now, let me tell you what this is not meaning. Just because there's two men in a bed, there's nothing to see here. Okay. Isaiah 45, 14 in your King James Bible tells you that there is no God. Oh yeah, look it up. Revelation 1, 13 has Jesus pictured with female breasts, which is a Baphomet imagery. Uh, the word paps is the word mastos, which is female breasts. So you've got Jesus with female breasts and he's touching babies. OK, and then you've got Jesus being called a holy thing in Luke 135 in the King James Bible. This is blasphemy. And the angel answered and said unto her, the Holy Ghost shall come upon thee and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore, also that holy thing which shall be born. This is degradation. This is diminishing the honor and, and uh, integrity of God and his name. And so for those of you that persist in, in suggesting that we're attacking the scriptures, the scriptures, what, what we say is, is that you are attacking God himself. Because in order to maintain your position, you're going to have to defend these atrocities. And by doing so, you are then going to be found to be attacking the very nature and character of God himself. This is why God is, is bringing this judgment to test you whether you know him or whether you just know the book, just like he did with Abraham. Abraham was required to choose between following the written known passages about God or the voice of God. Oh yeah, it's the same test. Revelation 1.6 teaches us that God the Father has a father and hath made us kings and priests unto God and his Father. You, you can try to suggest that it's just worded properly. It's a bad translation. But taken together, the, in the aggregate, you can no longer wiggle off the hook like that. What it should say is that it is God and Father. I'm sorry, it should be his God and Father not God and his father. It's a semantics. It's a word switch. It's a subtle deception. But taken together in the aggregate, it's very clear because now you have cross dressing is forbidden in Deuteronomy 22 5. But in Exodus 28 40, you've got dress up time with Aaron and the kiddies. And for Aaron's sons, thou shalt make coats and thou shalt make them make for them girdles and bonnets shalt thou make for them. See, I don't care what your underlying you know, Hebrew or Greek says. I don't care because we don't read that. We read the English words. And at some point, the English words have to be so overtly distorted that you will have to jump ship. So the example that I give is if you woke up tomorrow and your King James Bible and every Bible said, God so loved the world, he sent his only begotten daughter. Okay, so you would have such a cognitive dissonance broken over you because you would know for sure that there's no way Jesus is a woman, right? So that level of overtness is not being used. So this is purposely coming in under the level of consciousness of most believers, but not once this book gets in your hands. And in the hands of of your donors. This book is going to be funded by people with wealth, with extreme wealth. And the book is going to get into the hands of your people, whether you like it or not. And they don't have an agenda like you do. And when they see the evidences, they're going to be, their jaw is going to be on the ground and they're going to be coming to you with the same 14 questions that I'm going to pose to you in this video. And you can ignore me, but you won't ignore them, dear soul. Revelation 15, 6, you got the angels wearing girdles and bonnets and lace. Exodus 28, 37, thou shalt put it on a blue lace. Aprons, Genesis 3, 7, it's just unbelievable. 
Proverbs 26.10, God rewards fools and transgressors. Acts 12.4, Easter is celebrated. And Isaiah 3.17, the Lord is discovering the secret parts of women. All right, so I'm going to go on to the next question. Those were, uh, I'm sorry about that juggernaut of filth. That's what's in your Bibles. And you're going to have to deal with your doctrine being wrong because it's wrong. All right, well, the next question that we have is regarding very strange evil twins that are showing up in our Bibles that we've never noticed before. And I can do this everywhere I go. Any church environment, any Christian, any church leader. Hey, have you ever noticed these names? No. And specifically, we're going to look at one of them, which has a number of additional anomalies around it, which is why is Noah spelled Noe and also Noah in the same New Testament? So you may have a memory of Noah being spelled Noe 20 years ago, but that does not prove that this is not a Mandela effect because I have the majority of people not remembering it. And that goes to different reasons why there could be false memories, but it's primarily because this anomaly has anomalies within it. We can both be right. You may have a what we call a time tributary or a reality bubble where that reality is true for you on this one thing. So just have an open mind because as I go out, I can show people Noah is now called Noe in Matthew 24, 37. Jeremiah is called Jeremy in Matthew 2, 17. Asher is called Aser. Hosea is called Osi in Romans 9.25. Nephtali is Nephtalim. John the Baptist is John Baptist, Matthew 14.8. Elijah is referred to as Elias in Matthew 17.3. John is Joses. Isaiah is Esaias in Matthew 3.3. 3. Timothy is Timotheus. Manasseh is referred as Manasses in Matthew 1.10. Ephraim is Joseph. Zebulun is Zebulon, and my favorite, Boaz, is referred to as Booz in Matthew 1.5. Now, the number one explanation for this mind-bending anomaly is that the reason it's translated like this, John, is it's a transliteration, which basically means they couldn't translate it verbatim, so they get a phonetic spelling of it. Okay, well... First of all, no, uh, I don't care what your analogy is. It's like if I went into the living room and the living room was painted brown for 10 years and now it's blue. And I go into my spouse and I say, honey, you didn't tell me you're going to paint the living room and it's blue now. And she says, no, it's always been blue. It's always been blue for 10 years. And I say, what are you talking about? It's always been brown. And this is her response. Well, honey, they've been painting living rooms blue over in Europe for 10 years, and that's the way it is. The reason, the underlying reason of providing some commentary is irrelevant. Our memory is the evidence. Memory or testimonial evidence is admissible in court. The memory of human beings is admissible as evidence, which means it's true and valid. So the fact that I can go out into any environment and have most Christians shocked that these words, the first time they've ever come to their attention, is evidence. Okay. However, as we drill down, what we find is that there are corroborating evidence to support our vivid memories. And the first one is Matthew 24, 37, where we see Noah spelled Noe. So it says, but as the days of Noe were, so shall also come the coming of the Son of Man be. However, or let me just say that Strong's 35, 75, and the transliteration is Noe. But when you go to 1 Peter 3, 20, you have which sometime were disobedient when once the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah. Now, this word that's translated Noah is also G3575. And the transliteration is also Noe. So my question 
is why is Noah spelled Noe and also Noah in the same New Testament? Now, both passages are translated from the same Greek word. Both passages have the same transliteration. Both passages appear in the same version and the same New Testament. And then those are corroborating evidence that most Christians don't remember this ever being in their Bibles this way. And if you were completely honest, neither do you. So, it's, if it's the same word in the original language, which it is, and the Blue Letter Bible says the transliteration is exactly the same for both words, which it does, then why would the translators translate it Noe in the Gospels and Noah in the Epistles? The answer is that they wouldn't. It's been supernaturally changed. Now, I did consult with a renowned Bible scholar, and he said that the two words which are translated differently into English, are derived from the same Greek word and the same dictionary. They both have the same transliteration, so there's no rational explanation why it would be transliterated differently in the same New Testament and the same version. Now, some have attempted to explain Noah's unique spelling of Noe by pointing out that the two audiences were made up of people with different ethnicities. But this is just stuff made up. It's SMU. Because first of all, there's no way to tell that from the scriptures. So it's a, just a wild guess. It's what I call a Hail Mary argument. And, you know, anyone's best guess is that Matthew 24 is probably addressed to a predominantly Jewish audience, whereas 1 Peter 3.20 is probably addressed to early Christians, a mix of Jews and Gentiles in Asia Minor. But even if you knew the ethnicity of the audience, that would, what would be the source of, of this conclusion? How would someone making this claim know that the translators were operating by this rule? The King James translators had 15 rules that they operated by, and none of them gives them an instruction to consider the ethnicity of the audience when choosing how to translate it into English. So, You'd have to explain how I can parade these evil twin versions for a host of patriarchs before any number of Bible scholars and get them to admit that it is the first time these name derivatives have come to their attention. How is that possible? And why are we seeing this word translated two different ways in the same version? Please help us understand how this can happen. All right, our next question is, why did God condone the sacrifice of reptiles? And why is the same word translated differently in the same chapter? This, of course, is what I'm referring to as Leviticus 12, 8 in the King James Bible. Leviticus 12, 6, we read, And when the days of her purifying are fulfilled for a son or a daughter, she shall bring a lamb for the first year for a burnt offering and a young pigeon, or a turtle dove. Now that word turtle dove is Strong's H8449. The transliteration is Tor. However, when you go two paragraphs later in Leviticus 12.8, you read this. And if she be not able to bring a lamb, then she shall bring two turtles, or two young pigeons. Now that word, translated turtles is the exact same word that was used to translate into turtle dove. It's H8449 and transliteration is exactly the same. So again, you have another example of the translators either being completely wildly incompetent and making bizarre random decisions, or you have absolute proof that the Bible's being supernaturally changed. Because not only is this an anomaly, and they're the exact same word, and there's no reason why to do this, but it introduces a biblical paradox into the text, as I'm going to show you. So our questions here are, explain why the translators would translate the same word with the same transliteration two different ways in the same chapter, only two paragraphs apart. And ask yourself this, is this the first time that you've ever come to your attention that the Bible is saying that God's people can sacrifice turtles or reptiles to God? 
Has that never come across your radar? Because that seems very unlikely. Now, if you're going to try to suggest that this little translation anomaly can be explained because these two words were used interchangeably in the King James vernacular, then I would ask you to explain how you come to that conclusion. That isn't true because you say it is. What rule book or reference material are you getting that from? How are you rightly dividing the word to come to that conclusion? See, because words mean things. A seer and a prophet are interchangeable because they mean virtually the same thing. The New Testament and the New Covenant are interchangeable, but turtle and turtle dove are not. One is a reptile and one is a bird. And if you go to the Gesenius Hebrew Chaldee Lexicon, which is a dictionary, what you will find is there is no etymology in the dictionary to indicate that this word has anything to do with turtles. So the presumption that it's, these words were interchangeable is made up. It's SMU. What you would need for the Bible to be true would be something like what you see on the screen. You'd need a half dove, half turtle. Then I would ask you to explain how I can go into the office of a hundred pastors and most of them will be forced to reluctantly admit that they had no idea that there was any reference to sacrificing turtles in their Bible. Explain how that could have escaped their notice and don't take my word for it. Go do it yourself. Hey pastor, in your memory, did God ever condone the sacrifice of reptiles? Of course not, Joe. No, I don't remember that. Well, that pastor, I'm sure, has done several eight-week series on Old Testament types and shadows during his ministry. And so I don't care if you can convince yourself that these two terms are interchangeable. What I'm telling you is after 40 years of wearing out Bibles, if my Bible or any of these content experts spoke anywhere about sacrificing turtles to God, then we would know it, period. Oh, yeah, yeah, I do. I do. I'm aware of that anomaly. Yeah, the Bible says that and the words are interchangeable or we'd have some explanation. But we would know it's in there, dear soul. <laughs> now, my last piece of corroborating evidence is that not all of the commentaries have caught up with this new timeline update that we're now in. When you go to Ellicott's commentary for Leviticus 12.8, what you still see is turtle dove. All the other commentaries will say turtle. So they're giving commentary on 12.8 and they're saying, as a merciful provision for those who were too poor to bring a lamb, the law permits them to bring a turtle. Well, this one hasn't been changed yet. And I predict that if this is now uh, September, September 7th, 2024, I predict that somewhere in the near future, we can all go back to Eliot's commentary and it will then, it will say turtle. This will change in the future. That's my prediction. I had to put a disclaimer in the front of my book because some of the biblical citations that I had put in had already changed by the time I went back to review my book again. <laughs> That's right. That is right. Now, this particular anomaly gets worse because what about the emphasis that God puts on offerings being spotless? Okay, because in Leviticus eleven twenty nine, 29, God names turtles as unclean. So why would God turn around and receive an unclean animal as a sacrifice? Leviticus 11.29, These also shall be unclean unto you among the creeping things that creep upon the earth, the weasel, the mouse, and the tortoise. Now, if you go to Leviticus 1.3, what it says is, If the offering is a burnt offering from the herd, you are to offer a male without defect. You must present it at the entrance to the tent of the meeting so that it will be acceptable. Do not offer anything that has a defect because it will not be accepted. Now, this doesn't specifically say do not offer anything unclean. I don't find that anywhere in the text. 
But the commentaries agree that anything that is unclean is has a defect. Therefore, you have a glaring biblical anomaly here, a biblical paradox, because Leviticus 1 forbids the sacrifice of things that are unclean, and Leviticus 12 gives you permission to. So at the very least, after all these revisions, the translators or revisionists should have seen this as an error and fixed it. But that's not why it's in there. The reason that it's in there is because it's being supernaturally changed. Just like Pharaoh's magicians changed wood to a, a snake. So don't think this is impossible. Just look at Revelation 13, where God gives the beast power and authority. He gives them permission to wage war against the saints. And it is said, who can make war with this guy? Well, that's what you would say about somebody that can fiddle with space-time and matter like this. All right, our next question is, why did God command the sacrifice of both male and female sheep in the book of Le Leviticus? So, explain is how this is not a showstopper for almost all Christians that know their Bibles. How do you explain that wherever I go, when I tell people about this passage, they all say, no way was that ever in my Bible. And I mean, they're adamant about it. And in most cases, this passage, this passage convinces them that the Bible's changing. This one right here. I very often am told, I don't know, some of those changes, John, seem familiar, but when you told me that there was female sheep, I knew the Bible was changing. For whatever that's worth, I just throw it out there. So, what I'm showing you is unfamiliar. It's in most translations. However, it also now introduces a significant biblical paradox into the text because what you have in the same book, in Leviticus 1, is if his offering be a burnt sacrifice of the herd, let him offer a male without blemish. Same thing in Exodus 12.5. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male. Now, if you look at the commentaries, this would be probably the number one way to try to explain this Bible change away, is that there is a succession of severity of so of sins and corresponding offerings. So the more severe a sin is, the more pure the offering is. And then you have allocation for people who don't have a lot of money. And there's all these reasons why you might have God telling you, I want a male sacrifice. Actually, no, I want a female sacrifice. No, this is the problem that church leaders now have, is they're going to be worn out. This is the wearing down of the saints. And you're going to get worn out trying to make sense out of what the devil is doing. He's got you wrapped around his finger, running in circles. And what we're seeing is, is, is sermons being created. The beauty is in the details. Why is Jesus spitting in people's faces? I've saw pastors at the pulpit for the first time seeing that two men are in a bed. They had never really known it before because their face, they were shocked. And they felt obligated to provide some disclaimer to their congregation because the innuendo is so obvious. And so what you're going to have to do if you don't understand that your doctrine is wrong, the doctrine of preservation is wrong, you're going to be forced to defend these things. The female sheep thing is not only unfamiliar, but it introduces a very thorny doctrinal problem because it's part of a theme. Revelation 1.13, Jesus is pictured as having paps, which is mastos, which is female breasts. And it now says that Jesus is touching babies. And now you have a type and shadow of Christ in the female version. And so this, if I'm a bad actor, this is beginning to give me doctrinal permission to claim all kinds of very dark stuff about our Savior and draw us into all kinds of blasphemy. 
Okay, the next question is explain how all pastors could be confused by misquotes from pop culture. I think out of all the attempts to explain our testimony, this one is probably the most implausible. We ask pastors and church leaders, the intelligentsia of the body of Christ, people with PhDs in theology, how do you explain the universal and repeatable experience that we can go to any learned man or woman of God, give them 10 or 20 familiar passages, and they will all get most of them wrong the same way every time. And this has never happened before in recorded history. Explain why they all misremember in the same identical way. And so if you suggest that this empirical observation can be explained by the fact that all church leaders are getting so many familiar passages wrong because they're being confused by misquotes from pop culture or something akin to the telephone game, then please answer the following questions. If church leaders are trying to explain our testimony away by suggesting that we are biblically illiterate and we're just confused boobs and we're stirring up trouble on the internet, then how do you explain the church leader's inability to answer simple fill-in-the-blanks quiz questions if they are so qualified and they're so literate in the Bible, how can they so easily be overpowered by misquotes from pop culture? Is it your testimony that virtually all pastors are spending countless hours surfing Facebook and having all of their studies of the scriptures overwhelmed by implanted thoughts? Explain how a misquote from pop culture or a misquote from an old sermon preached many years ago, a song, a tapestry, or a poem, could be repeated enough times to overcome all of the following influences that a devout Christian would engage in on a regular basis. Okay, that's including, but not limited to, reading our Bibles, reading our daily devotional, listening to Christian messages, sermons, or materials, listening to Christian music, attending church services, singing hymns and worship songs, attending Bible studies, meditating on the Bible, right? Because reading the Bible and studying the Bible are not the same thing, and meditating on the Bible is not the same thing. Reading Christian books, articles, and blogs, and then my favorite one, memorizing the Bible. The Bible is pretty much the only book that I ever consider committing to memory. And that's true with most Christians. And so these influences that I've just listed are taking place on a daily, weekly, monthly basis. That's turning into years and decades. In my case, it's four decades of doing many of these things regularly. So then my question is, how does a misquote from pop culture overpower all of these influences, not with one scripture, but 30 to 50 scriptures. Let that sink in. Let that just percolate there in your rational thinking. A devout believer or pastor will be involved in some of the, some or more of, some or more of all of these on a regular basis. All of those influences would be reinforcing the passages that appear in the text. But when pastors are quizzed, they give a different answer. In order for your argument to appear rational, you would have to explain how all these repetitive influences, including memorizing, would be overcome by a casual glance at a social media post that's incorrect. And does your hypothesis actually have any validity? Please provide some of your research to support your claim. Provide the names of the media outlets that you suggest and how they're repeating these things over and over, how they're prominently displayed so the first visit to the first page would see them. And then provide screenshots so that we can see the examples because we don't believe you. You could use my Bible quiz that's on my website, wakeuporelse.com. Go to the resources tab. That'll give you a list of scriptures that we suggest are changing. And then go get screenshots of those 
in that form and show them to us because we don't believe you. We think that you are just offering a Hail Mary argument it has no validity. So document how these misquotes are being repeated enough to overcome all of the disciplines. Many church leaders have been forced to suggest that this mixed up is also maybe caused by a preacher that misquoted it 30 years ago. That's their words, not mine. Well, if that's true, in order for that exposure to be able to be overcome by all of this studying and activity, there would have to be some conspiratorial group that was funding a huge ad budget for the last three to four decades to push those misquotes out on, on not just one, but 30 to 50 passages every year for the past 40 years. Is that what you're trying to suggest? <laughs> the only other argument that I've heard was the suggestion, that, well, people just don't read their Bible anymore. And so it's all just confusion. Well, that's a baseless argument. It's bearing false witness. And it's not true. You have no evidence of that. I'm presenting evidence, seven different types of evidence. And all we get back from the church leaders is in insults, threats, and decrees. And they ignore our questions. And those days are over. I'm here to tell you, by the grace of God, by the decree of the throne, that the days of sweeping this under the rug are over. And you're going to have to pick a side. Okay? Content experts are not confused by misquotes from pop culture. It is ridiculous. All right, the next question. Explain the catastrophic memory failure that all pastors are exhibiting. Now this one, I'm going to provide evidence that this is true, and this one will be the most compelling argument of all arguments. Okay, because essentially, I have the math on the probabilities now. If I provide you with 10 different people that are given 10 fill in the blanks questions and they all get them wrong the same way, this, th that is statistically impossible according to chat GBT and people that have corroborated chat's assumptions. Okay, the chances of that happening is 10 with 200 zeros after it because people misremember differently. So if 10 people are given 10 simple Bible quiz questions and they get all 10 of them wrong and they misremember them the same way, that would be absolute unequivocal proof that some outward force or something unexplainable is causing that. It can't be misremembering, random misremembering. It, it's statistically impossible. Okay, so here, however, because I don't have that in this video, I'm going to give you a simple observation which does the same thing. And this observation is not only impossible to explain away, it's also repeatable. You can do this yourself. So if you go to my website, Wake Up or Else, go to the Resources tab, download either Universal or King James Only Bible Quiz, and go ask pastors for yourself. Be sure to ask them what version they use. So if it's King James Only, use, use that. If, if they use other passages, use the Universal one. Now, I just did this yesterday, and I'm going back to the street today, and I had a gentleman and his wife, and I asked them 10 fill-in-the-blanks questions that they had to offer from their long-term memory. It wasn't an alternate choice or a yes or no question. They had to come up with the answer out of their mouth. And they got 10 out of 10 incorrect. It was zero for 10. Once I do that with 10 people on video, I will have unequivocal proof as far as I can see. Now, this one goes like this. Assuming that no one in this example is under the influence of controlled substances, alcohol, assuming they have no mental illness or they're not lying or running a scam, if you were to ask a seasoned airline pilot to simply identify 10 of the instruments on his panel by name, what is your expectation of how many they would get correct? Now, of course, 
most people would say, well, they'd get 10 out of 10. I would hope so because they're flying the plane, right? Now, apply the same question to a seasoned doctor. Ask the doctor 10 simple anatomy questions that a first-year medical student would be able to get correct. Now, what is your expectation of the doctor being able to answer 10 simple anatomy questions? Every time I've done this so far, everybody would say, well, they'd get 10 out of 10. Now, I want you to think if you approached a KJV-only pastor with KJV-only questions. So in this example, he's not drunk, he doesn't have mental illness, he's not confused by other versions because he doesn't read other versions, and you're only asking him changes from the King James Bible. And it's not a modernization because the, the questions that you'll ask him are in the 1611, all revisions, the 1769 Oxford, and any King James Bible that you can find on any shelf in any form in any century. There is no other King James Bible where these are not there. I've made certain of that. The questions you are asking are simple. They're not complicated like something from the book of Ezekiel. Now, what is your expectation? I'll give you an example. Hey, pastor, fill in the blank. Judge not, blank he be judged. And he's going to tell you lest, and he'll be wrong. And we'll do that again. We'll say, hey, pastor, in Job, what did, what did Job say when God was uh, running him through the ringer? The Lord blanks, and the Lord blanks away. Well, the Lord giveth, and the Lord taketh away. Wrong. You're, so far, you're two, zero for two. And you go boom, 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 and you get 10 wrong. Hey, pastor, who went into uh, Egypt and killed the firstborn? Oh, the death angel. Wrong. Hey, pastor, who wrestled with Jacob all night? Oh, the angel. Wrong. Wrong, 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 wrong. Zero for 10. And all of his answers are coming out of his memory. I'm not feeding him anything. What's your expectation that he would get 10 right? It's the same as the pilot. But he gets 10 wrong. How is that possible? The way that you can understand the impossibility is imagine if the pilot got 10 wrong. Imagine if suddenly, for the first time in his 30-year career, he, can't, he gives you a different name for each of the, of the uh, instruments. And it's not just him, it's every pilot. Or he can't, he can't tell you what the name of the thing is suddenly. Well, he wouldn't be able to fly anymore. So this is a repeatable uh, test, and it is, provides searing logic that there is something happening outside of us. This is not all in our heads. Something in the environment is changing. It's something very unexplainable, and it's really uh, one of the strongest evidences that I have. All right, the next question is, if the Bible can't change, then why has it been changing continuously since its inception? That's right. This is another important observation because I believe that for the most part, many of us have simply believed what we were told. For decades, I've watched the man of God in the front of the room hold up his Bible and declare, I hold in my hand the eternal, unchanging Word of God. But as I went back into the scriptures to look and see about how unchanging it is, I found that it's actually been changing constantly from its inception. First of all, you've got new covenants that introduce change into the text since the beginning. Most scholars agree that there are four covenants specifically for Israel and three for all of mankind. Church scholars and church leaders who represent the Bible as a static, fixed, immovable object are not thinking straight. How can you say the Bible doesn't change when it seems like God is cutting a new deal and changing the rules every time you turn around. Additionally, you have numerous examples of the scripture modifying itself. Scripture modifies other scripture. And you're agreeing with me because that's what you mean whenever you've told somebody, well, Joe or Sally, in order to properly exegete this passage, you have to consider the whole counsel of God. You ever say that to somebody? Well, let me... Let me decipher that for you. In other words, what you think you understand, Sally, 
what you think you're understanding because you're taking it in context may not actually mean what you think it means here because over here and then over here you have to interpret all of that as well so you really can't interpret quite like that okay that's an example of scripture changing other scripture but let me give you some more examples matthew 12 3 and he answered haven't you read what david did when he and his companions were hungry he entered the house of god and he and his companions ate the consecrated bread which was not lawful for them to do hmm well this is interesting this is jesus the scripture changing the other scripture the pharisees he was adjusting their doctrine. Okay, then you have Leviticus 23, 4. These are the four feasts of the Lord, even holy convocations, which you shall proclaim in their seasons. Well, that's fine until Paul comes along in Colossians and he introduces another passage which nullifies Leviticus 23. Now, you can try to commentary your way out of this, but my observation is, will stand. Leviticus 23 changed. And actually, if you try to make the argument that, well, that was prophesied and this was God's plan from the beginning, you make my point. My point is that there was prophecies that foretold the Bible being supernaturally changed as well. Daniel 7.25, Amos 8.11, 2 Thessalonians 2, Revelation 22, Revelation 13. Those are passages which foretold this event as well. And they modify whatever preservation promises you're relying on, just like Colossians modifies Leviticus 23. Here's another example, Leviticus 3, 17. In this one, if you ever wanted a clear preservation promise, this is it. This is written in stone. It is a perpetual statute. Throughout your generations, in all your dwellings, you shall not eat any fat or any blood. Now, if I'm standing there when that was read to me, I would be like, okay, well, that goes to the end of time. Uh, except when Paul comes along with Romans 14, 20, do not destroy the work of God for the sake of food. Don't eat, don't eat any fat. Eh, you can eat whatever you want. Ceremonial law is done away with. All food is clean. Romans 14 modifies Leviticus 3, 17, the Bible changed. So if the Bible's changing, how could you say it doesn't change? Deuteronomy 4, 2, you shall not add unto the word which I command you, neither shall you diminish aught from it. Well, again, if you're going to be a literalist and you're going to say, these are the commands of God that he will preserve his word, Thy word is forever settled in heaven, O Lord. The Bible can't change. All right, well, if you're going to be like that, then you got to be like that with Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy 4.2, there should not have been any additional scripture after Deuteronomy, or at least after Moses, because he's saying, you shall not add unto the word which I command you. This should have been the last of the scriptures. All the other major and minor prophets in the whole New Testament is uh, out of order according to this. Okay, Galatians 2, 11, But when Peter was come to Antioch, I withstood him to the face because he was to be blamed. Galatians 2, 14, But when I saw that they walked not uprightly, according to the truth of the gospel, I said unto Peter, Before them all, if thou being a Jew, livest after the manner of Gentiles, and not as the, do the Jews, why compellest them? So, so Paul, who is the scripture, is coming to Peter, inspired Peter, who is the scripture, and is having to make adjustments. Paul is having to change the scripture. Peter was confused about the new rules that they were operating on. He was caught in between a transition from old covenant to new covenant, and he didn't get the memo. He didn't understand how it worked under the new deal. Okay, and what, what I'm saying is that we now find ourselves in a similar transition into a post-canonized scripture church era. And we now operate under new rules, and I cover many of those in my book, 
which you can get for free on wakeuporelse.com. I cover that, I believe it's chapter 6, New Doctrines. And the church is unaware that they are now operating under new rules, just like Peter was. Okay, moving on. Exodus 20, 13, thou shalt not kill. It used to say thou shalt not murder. It's been changed. However, I'm introducing the fact that Scripture changes Scripture. Matthew 5, 21 comes along. Hey, you've heard it was said of old, in old time, thou shalt not kill, and whoever shall kill shall be in danger of the judgment. But I say unto you, <laughs> that statement, but I say unto you, indicates that what he's saying next is a change to the Bible. It was like this, but now it's not like that. It's like this. That is an example of the Bible changing. Numbers 15.32, a man who gathered sticks on the Sabbath was stoned to death. Mark 2.27, however, and he said unto them, the Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. If you need some sticks, it's going to be okay. Leviticus 11.1 1 lists clean and unclean animals for dietary laws. Acts 10, 9 through 16, gives us Peter's vision of unclean animals and God's command, what God hath cleansed, thou call not uncommon. Acts 10, 9 changes Leviticus 11. The Bible's changing. Then you have all these decrees by Jesus in Matthew 5, 21 through 43. The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel. You have heard that it was said to the people long ago, but I tell you, or but I say to you, he says that three or four different times. 2 Corinthians 3, 6, he has made us competent as ministers of a new covenant. But if you are led by the Spirit, you're not under the law. So these are proofs that the Bible has been changing since its inception. And so if it can't change, why is it changing? Okay, number 10, if God has changed the Bible before, why wouldn't he do it again? Now this strikes at the sentimental argument that God is so nice that he wouldn't do this. The consequences and the ramifications of the Bible changing are so dire that God would never do such a thing. I've heard that sentiment over and over and over. But we don't know this God. We don't understand how terrible and awesome his judgments can be. It is a judgment. It's supposed to be terrible. It's supposed to shock you into understanding there's a way that seems right to a man that leads to death. It's supposed to be terrible. And fortunately, and I cover this in detail, it is a redemptive judgment. It isn't punitive. It's designed to give you a spanking to bring you back into relationship with him and abandon a miracle-free intellectual substitute for what you are supposed to be like. All right. And so number 10 is if God has changed the Bible before, why wouldn't he do it again? All right. So in this observation, what I'm pointing out is is if God has removed his word as a judgment before, why wouldn't he do it again? What we see throughout the text is that God has used removing his word as a judgment a number of times. And so if he's done it before, it's certainly feasible he would do it again. It's, this is not some outrageous claim. It's backed by the authority of Scripture. So Amos 8.12 tells us about a famine that God would send to, into the land. But he says, it's not going to be a famine of bread. It's going to be a famine of the word. And they shall wander from sea to sea and from north to east. They shall run to and fro seeking the word of the Lord, but shall not find it. Now, it doesn't matter if it's a past or a future or present prophecy. It's a precedent. It shows that God has done this before. So he can do it again without announcing it. But I do show I believe quite convincingly that this Amos 8 is a future prophecy. It is tied to Revelation, clearly. And therefore, it can be a prophecy of the present day. Now, you have an example of this idea in Psalm 74, 9, 
we do not see our signs. There is no longer any prophet, nor is there any among us who knows how long. O oh God, how long will, you, will the adversary reproach? Will the enemy blaspheme your name forever? Why do you withdraw your hand, even your right hand? No signs, no prophet. God's removing his word as a judgment. Okay, then you have 1 Samuel 3.1. Now the boy Samuel ministered to the Lord before Eli, and the word of the Lord was rare in those days. It doesn't tell us why. God went on vacation, you know, he just wanted to draw us out, or he was not happy. And so he's saying, I'm going to take my ball and go home. Whatever his motivations were, we're not told. But we are told that he drew back his word. Okay, Second Chronicles 15.3, For a long time Israel was without the true God, without a priest to teach, and without the law. For a long time. Ezekiel 7.26, mischief shall come upon mischief, and rumor shall come upon rumor. Then shall they seek a vision of the prophet, but the law shall perish from the priests and counsel from the ancients. Micah 3.6, therefore night will come over you without visions and darkness, without divination. The sun will set for the prophets and the day will go dark for them. The seers will be ashamed and the diviners disgraced. They will all cover their faces because there is no answer from God. You might as well say, because he allowed the devil to change the Bible. This is not uncharacteristic of God to be doing this at all. I've just given you five examples, and here's two more. Hosea 4, 6, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge, but it goes on to say this. Because you have rejected knowledge, I also reject you as my priests. Because you've ignored the law of the God, I will ignore your children. Ezekiel 14, 4. I, the Lord, will answer him who comes according to the multitude of his idols. I cover this in great detail in the book. That I may seize the house of Israel by their heart. This gets at the reason why God is doing this right here. He wants your heart, not your head. You cannot know God with your little peanut brain. All of your high-sounding arguments and your doctrine are just really sort of nauseating to God. He wants childlike faith that's passionate and on fire and is in action. We have exchanged action for the higher halls of learning. And, and the Bible, as, as counterintuitive as it may appear, has become an idol. Like your kid's cell phone when you're with them and they're chatting and talking to somebody else. It's an insult. Don't you love me? Don't you want to know me? Don't you want to be with me? Put the phone away. Ezekiel 14.9 And if the prophet is deceived and speaks a word, I, the Lord, will have deceived that prophet. This is something that a lot of believers remember too, so we don't allocate this to a Bible change. But see, just... The fact that I have to say that is the peril that you're in. If you don't know that this is happening, you won't even know that you now have to interpret whether something is inspired or not. You're just going to accept everything is inspired. And I don't, we don't have all the answers. Like, what are we supposed to do? Well, that isn't a reason that it's not happening. The fact that it introduces unimaginable ramifications is not proof that it isn't happening. Don't make yourself smarter than God. Just because you think that it's terrible and God wouldn't do it. I'm sorry, God kills children. God went into Egypt and, and well, actually, it used to say that God sent the death angel. Now it says he went in there and killed the children. But either way, he had a meeting with the death angel. And he says, listen, I want you to go down there and I want you to kill all the kids all the firstborn males. And I don't know what that meeting was like. I'm sure the angel had no, uh, no response except to go. But imagine the angel being, boss, are you sure about this? I mean, this is the God we serve. So please spare me the sentimental arguments like Peter rebuking Jesus. You're not going to go to the cross on my dead body. You're not in my watch. No, get behind me, Satan. You're just concerned with the affairs of man. 
The fact that God is stepping into you with the Tower of Babel intervention is the greatest thing that will ever happen to your walk with God. It's just going to disrupt your ministry. You'll have to take your anchor families and go start an independent church because the, uh, the district isn't going to sanction you telling everybody from the pulpit that your Bible's being fiddled with by the devil. I'm here this morning to share with you that the devil has his filthy fingers in Grandma's Gutenberg. You will be dismissed summarily. You'll lose your pension and you will be branded a heretic. So this is not happy bells. You're not going to win any popularity contests, but you'll have God on your side. First Kings 22, 19, finally a spirit came forward, stood before the Lord and said, I will entice him. By what means, the Lord asked, I will go out and be a deceiving spirit in the mouths of all his prophets. He said, well, listen to this. You will succeed in enticing him, said the Lord. Go and do it. I do remember that as well. You probably do as well. So here you have God condoning deception. And by the way, I'm going to give you three other examples of that. Jehu used subtlety to trap the uh, prophets of Baal and kill them all. Rahab the harlot lied to protect the spies. She made it into the Hebrews 11 Hall of Fame for doing so. And then God was telling Samuel, I want you to go up and anoint David as king. Sam says, well, if I do that, Saul will kill me. So this is what God said. All right, well, just tell him you're going up to sacrifice. Well, that's duplicity. I'm not calling God a liar, but here it is, dear soul. It's 1 Kings 22, that God is going to come at you. He's going to release a demon of lying demon and, and attacking you. <laughs> I'm sorry, it's in your Bible. So the fact that he will allow this to happen is totally biblical. Numbers 22, 20. That night God came to Balaam and said, Since these men have come to summon you, go with them and do only what I tell you. So this is the words where God finally lets Balaam do what he kept bugging God to do, which was to go against the word. All right, moving on, number 11. Do the following questions convince you that we're not misremembering? Okay, so unfortunately for the unconvinced, they don't really have any real good arguments. So what they have to do is attack our testimony. Okay, so our testimony is that something unexplainable is happening. The testimony of the unconvinced is, no, your testimony is wrong. This is what your testimony is. You're misremembering. Okay, so here's my response to that. My first question is, if you went to your aging parent and for the first time in your life, you found that they didn't recognize you, what conclusion would you draw? Now, as I've done this over the last year, I've always gotten the same response. The people would say, well, they would have to be suffering for dementia. Okay, so assuming that you answered mental illness, my next question is, why didn't you suggest that they were just misremembering? And I'll let you think about that for a second. All right, now, what you're trying to say is the reason that you didn't suggest misremembering is because you believe that when it comes to vivid memories, like recognizing the face of your own child, your experience, your belief, is that the human memory is so reliable when it comes to vivid memories that if a parent couldn't recognize their child, the only explanation would have to be that their brain wasn't working, that they had been seized upon by disease because the brain is so reliable that of course it would recognize the child. Okay, now, Let's hold on to that admission by you that the human memory isn't uh, unreliable. It's very reliable. That's what you just admitted to. All right, so the next question is, would you agree that you chose mental illness over misremembering because you believe the human memory is so reliable when it comes to vivid memories like recognizing your child? The only explanation for a parent not recognizing the face of their own child would be mental illness. Yes? Say it. You got to say the yes or no. Yes. Okay. I agree. All right. Next question. Would you agree that you just admitted that you believe the human memory is extremely reliable when it comes to vivid memories? Yes or no? Well, this and that. This. Yes or no? Please. Just 
don't be an embarrassment to the ideal of being a truth bearer. Just because this is painting you into a corner that you don't want to be in, God is watching. So I'm going to ask you again, would you agree that you just admitted that you believe that the human memory is extremely reliable when it comes to vivid memories? Yes or no? Okay, I'm going to assume that you have integrity and you answered yes, and I'm going to move on. If I told you that I have a memory of two different events from my childhood, would you be able to tell me which one is more vivid? Of course, the answer is no. You can try to suggest, well, memories that are repeated often enough will be the most vivid. Well, I actually have a study in my book. It's called the Vividness of Memory Sources. And this study indicates that re repetition is not the number one criteria for establishing a vivid memory. According to their research, it's actually the emotional state that you were in when the memory was formed. So if you can't possibly know that, then you couldn't possibly know which of the two memories that I have are the most, which one is the most vivid. And I think it's 1 Corinthians 2 tells us that who knows the spirit of a man except the man. So I'm going to assume your answer is, no, I couldn't possibly know how vivid your memory is. Okay, so based on those questions, here's the question. Are you ready? Are we misremembering? I believe if you're honest, you are about to admit that we're not misremembering. You ready? Since you concluded the aging parent's memory failure could only be explained by mental illness, and you agree that there's no way for you to know how vivid a Mandelite's memories are, and the Mandelites claim that some of our memories are as vivid as our children's faces. See, that's our testimony. You can't dismiss our testimony because you don't like it. Our testimony is that some of these memories, not all of them, are as vivid as our children's faces. So therefore, would you then agree that unless you can prove that millions of Mandelites have mental illness, the cause for millions of Mandelite effect testimonies could not rationally be categorized as misremembering in the same way that you could not categorize the aging parent not recognizing their own child as misremembering. I'd really love comments on that question. I would like to see somebody rationalize their way out of that. All right, now the next question, or let me finish this last question. Would you agree that if the cause for millions of Mandela effect testimonies is not misremembering, then the most likely alternative is that there is an end time sign and wonder that is causing reality to change, and the changes do include our Bibles and the Mandela effect community is correct. All right, now the second thing that we hear quite frequently to try to explain our testimony is that we're delusional. So I'd like for you to answer these questions regarding delusion. Would you agree that if the unconvinced are correct and nothing has changed in the environment, then whatever's causing the Mandelites to believe that the reality is changing would all be taking place in our minds? Okay, let me restate it. If you're correct, you're the unconvinced, then everything that we're experiencing to make us have this testimony is happening in our heads. Would you agree with that? Okay, so would you agree that if we, as an example, believe that the Monopoly guy had a monocle when he never did, then the only way that that delusion could operate would be if false memories were being implanted into our minds. See, because what we're told is you're delusional. And then when I ask, well, how are we delusional? Because we have no history of mental illness. We're cogent. We're providing complex questions and research. And we're being told, you're delusional. Well, unless you can provide a rational explanation of how we're delusional, then you're delusional. Because delusional actually means you believe what's wrong and you're resistant to facts. Okay, so the best way I can explain how we would be delusional is that we would have to be experiencing false memories. We would have to be seeing the Monopoly guy in our minds having a monocle when he never did, because that's what we believe. And what's difficult is that you have the same memory. Okay, but we'll get to that. We have memories of the Monopoly guy having a monocle. And 
uh, you know, uh, hundreds of other things like that, all through pop culture and, of course, in the Bible. So, so right, if, if we're delusional, then we would have to have these false memories. So would you agree that since peer-reviewed studies have proven that both the Mandelite and the unconvinced share the same memories, and the unconvinced claim that the Mandelite is delusional based on implanted false memories, then by default, the unconvinced would then also be delusional. Okay, I have a peer-reviewed study that on the Mandel effect with 100 participants, and they documented that the, thought, the memories of the unconvinced group and the people claiming this is a phenomenon are identical. Now, it also bears out in your own experience. If I give you a quiz of, you know, Grand Central Station. No, it was Grand Central Terminal. The portrait of Dorian Gray. No, the picture of Dorian Gray. Cliff Notes. No, it's Cliff's Notes. And we just go down the line. Fruit of the Loom had a cornucopia. No, it never had one. The Ford logo has a pigtail. No, I remember it that way. And we go down all of these examples. You have the same memories that we do, dear soul. So would you then agree that if both groups share the same memories, then both groups would need to be considered delusional. And as a result, the hypothesis of the unconvinced would be nullified because you can't be delusional and then suggest that you are more rational than another group with the same delusion that you have. I don't think you want to be naming yourself as delusional, right? So do you have an alternative or an alternate hypothesis of how the Mandelites could be experiencing delusion? Because unless you can provide some sort of basis for your argument, then it's set aside. Your argument's overruled, and then our testimony gets entered into the court of public opinion, and as your donors see that you have no answer to these questions, they will begin to have the revelation that this is happening, and they begin to look at you as either the blind leading the blind, or worse, a co-conspirator. And so I'm suggesting that you get ahead of this so you can head off a mutiny. Now, would you agree that if you don't have an alternative hypothesis, in other words, you can explain how we're all delusional, then my reasoning regarding the delusion argument is sound and has eliminated the possibility that the Mandelite testimony can be explained away by delusion. Do you agree with my reasoning or not? Yes or no? Well, you're a heretic. Okay, goodbye. We'll see you in the funny papers. Would you agree that if you cannot provide a rational rebuttal to the logic of the two observations regarding misremembering and delusion, then you can no longer in good faith rely on these alternative explanations and they would need to be abandoned? Do you agree with that? Do you have the integrity to admit that misremembering and delusion are no longer an option in explaining away our testimony? Unless you can provide some sort of alternative hypothesis or answers to these questions, then if you persist in suggesting we're misremembering, all you are is a liar. And I fear for your soul because all you have is an agenda. Whatever it is, you just don't want your doctrine to be wrong or worse, if you're a leader, then you're protecting your kingdom. And all that that means, financial security, reputation, all that you built, I get it. You started in the living room with two families. And three years later, you finally went to a storefront and you gutted that out for five to seven years. And then you finally got it to where you could rent a building. You remember that day, boy, when you stepped on those grounds and you had, it just wasn't owned, you weren't owning it, but it was still a milestone. And then finally, you have a following of 800, 900 people. You got a pension for the love of heaven. You got health insurance. And you bought your own property and built a church. And now I come along. I come along with this terrible idea that goes against a thousand years of established orthodox doctrine. And you just are no way are you going to budge off of that to, to bite down on this. I'm sorry. You're in peril, Pastor. Would you agree that if you abandon these alternative explanations that there is no other logical explanation for our testimony. In other words, if, it's, if our testimony can't be explained by misremembering or delusion, then what can explain it? 
There is no other explanation because you can't just you can't just um, say, well, I don't want this to be true, so I'm going to pretend you don't exist. You're not going to be allowed to do that anymore. Okay. And the last question is actually a, a, a Bible quiz. Now, these will not be biblical paradoxes like I shared with you before. These are going to be new scriptures we believe have changed, but they will not be biblical paradoxes. They'll just be unfamiliar. They don't really impact the doctrine anyway, but most people will get them wrong, and it should be proof for you as well that the Bible is changing. But my specific question is, why is it that most Christians get most of these wrong the same way? That becomes statistically impossible. And unless you want to abandon rational thinking, if you cannot provide an answer for that, then you are going to be forced to re-examine the doctrine of preservation. Now, I do have two types of quizzes. One is universal, so it's for all translations. Uh, then we have the King James only version. I've decided to use that one because it has a lot more changes and they're a lot more overt. But no matter what version you use, you're going to know that this is not belong in our Bible. It'll be familiar to you. And a lot of them are in other Bibles as well. Now, What's important to understand that the real proof is not that most people will misremember these, but that they will misremember them the same way. So at the end, I'm going to show you a quiz that I did with somebody in the street, and they got nine out of nine wrong, and we can repeat that as many times as we want with as many people as we want that know the Bible. They will all get them wrong the same way. Now, when we then use ChatGPT, as you can see on the screen here, to calculate the probabilities using very conservative assumptions, and the result that we got was 10 with to the 200th power, 10 with 200 zeros. Now, to put that in perspective, a trillion, so it's one in a trillion, would be 10 to the 12th power. A quadrillion is 10 to the 15th. A quintillion is 10 to the 18th. So... As the math will show, the probability of 10 people misremembering 10 simple Bible quiz questions the same way is 10 to 2 Google. 10 to the 200th power. It's impossible. All right, so let's begin. This is Luke 19.27. These will be fill-in-the-blanks quizzes, but those mine enemies which would not that I should reign over them Bring them hither and slay them before me. That's right. Jesus is giving instruction in this passage to kill all of those that do not follow him. And you can try to suggest that it's a parable, but that's irrelevant because everywhere I go, whenever I share this with people, they're shocked. I'm talking at the 90% level, Christians who will vow on their grave that was never in their Bible. So you have to explain that. All right, Luke 5, 24, arise, take up thy blank and blank. Talking to the paralytic, take up thy couch and go into thy house. Hmm. Now, also want to mention the scriptures that I'm referencing do all appear in the Cambridge 1611 version, every revision in the 1769 Oxford. And they're in every Bible, on every shelf, every King James Bible in any century. So this is not some modernization. I have eliminated that possibility. So what you're seeing is in your Bible, it's in Grandma's Gutenberg, it's in the 1611, it is not a modernization. Okay, and there you see, arise, take up thy couch in the 1611, just so you see it yourself. Matthew 7, 1, judge not, blank, ye be judged. What most people remember is judge not, lest ye be judged, but it doesn't say that. It has never said that. It doesn't say it in any translation, so it's nowhere. It doesn't exist. But yet, it's in the long-term memory of not only everybody in the world, but church leaders, content experts, will tell me that. 
There it is. It's nowhere to be found. There's only one. The Aramaic Bible in plain English has the word lest in it, but it just says, you shall not judge lest ye be ju you be judged. So it isn't, it isn't out there. Luke 19, 23, wherefore then gavest not thou my money into the, where did they put their money? Oh, back in the old Bible days. Well, it turns out they put their money in the bank. Luke 19, 23. Luke 2, 46, and it came to pass that after three days they found him, that's Jesus, in the temple, sitting in the midst of the, who was he sitting with? The doctors. Sounds like he wandered into a hospital. Luke 17, 31. In that day, he which shall be on the housetop and his blank in the house, let him not come down. He's talking about his belongings. How about the word stuff? We see that the King James Bible especially is now filled with modern words like stuff. I have a giant list of them in my book, which you can download for free at wakeuporelse.com. John 12, 24, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a blank of wheat fall into the ground and die. What, what was it uh, that he referenced? Uh, a blank of wheat. How about a corn of wheat? A corn of wheat? Matthew 26, 7, there came unto him a woman having an alabaster box of very precious ointment and poured it where? Where did she pour it? She poured it on his head. I'm just saying a lot of people remember pouring it on his feet, wiping her hair with it. Now she's dumping it on his head. Exodus 2, 3, this is a really strong one. This is about baby Moses when they put him in something put him in the river, but when she could hide him no longer, she got a blank for him and coated it with blank. What did the, uh, I guess it was a Hebrew woman or an Egyptian woman, I can't remember, but where did she put him? Did you say she put him in a basket? Did you say that? Because what she actually put him in was an ark of bulrushes. That's the kind of thing that would stick out in your memory if you were a King James only person. So if you said basket, how did you come up with that? And when it gets worse, and daubed it with slime and with pitch and put the child therein and she laid it in the flags by the river's brink. Anyway, Luke 3.16, I indeed baptize you with water, but one mightier than I cometh the latchet of whom's blank I am not worthy to unloose. What was, uh, what was the uh, latchet of what? What was on his feet? Did you say sandals? Because what the King James has always said is actually shoes, another modern word. Isaiah 11, 6, who laid down with the lamb? It's that millennial reign reference when everything is peaceful. And the blank shall dwell with the lamb. Did you say lion? Because it's always said wolf. Yes. Now it does mention lion later on in the verse, but if that was in the long-term memory of the entire world, when we ask people who laid down with the lamb, they would say, oh, the young lion. But they don't say that. And it isn't anywhere in any version. You can't find it. And it is in the 1611 Cambridge version. And it's in the revisions. It's in the 1769. It's in your Bible. It's in Grandma's Gutenberg. It's in every King James Bible that you can find in any form on any shelf in any century. So there's no escape, dear soul. There's no way to rationalize this out and find, you know, there's no version that you think exists out there that says line. It doesn't exist. It's even in the Dead Sea Scrolls. Okay, Hosea 4, 6, my people blank for lack of knowledge. Did you say perish? Because you'd be incorrect. It actually says my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. And of course, there are no translations that say perish, so there's no way for it to have gotten in our long-term memory. And if you go to Amazon, 
Right now, you can find two books for sale called My People Perish for Lack of Knowledge. Having written two books and paid $2,000 for somebody to edit it, I can tell you for sure that you wouldn't get the title wrong on the cover. Anyway, Luke 6.49, But he that heareth and doeth not is like a man that without a foundation built an house upon the blank, against which the blank did beat vehemently. What did the foolish man build his house on? Did you say the sand? And what came against it? Did you say the wind? Because now what it says is he built it on the earth and what came against it was the stream. It's very unfamiliar for most people. Exodus 7.10, and blank cast down his rod before Pharaoh. So you got Moses and Aaron when the big showdown with Pharaoh, who threw down the staff? And it turned into a snake. Was it Moses or Aaron? Well, most people remember Moses, but now it's Aaron. And you may remember Aaron. So don't just think, oh, I remember Aaron. Therefore, this entire three-hour presentation is nullified. Don't, don't think like that. Genesis 32, 24. And Jacob was left alone, and there wrestled someone with him until the breaking of the day. Who did Jacob wrestle with all night? Did you say an angel? Because now it says it, he wrestled a man. See, at a certain point, when these start piling up one upon another, you start to really have to slow down and think, is this really possible? Matthew 6, and, and again, that's a, pr a preliminary proof. The real proof is if you said an angel, and then I get nine more people to say angel from their long-term memory. These are not multiple choice questions or yes or no questions. You have to come up with the answer out of your own long-term memory. And if I have 10 people that says angel instead of man, and we have 10 questions you do that on, that is impossible statistically. It cannot happen. Now, We'll talk about, does that then prove the Bible is changing? We'll talk about that at the end. So stay with me. Don't touch that dial. All right, this is a, a big one for a lot of people. The Lord's Prayer isn't what they remember. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done where? Did you say on earth? Because it says in earth. Going on from there, give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our what? Trespasses is what a lot of people remember. This one, I'm telling you, is a big one. This one's got a lot of people to, to decide this is happening. And you can find little commentaries. There's always this backstory. You can find the reason why the entire world remembers trespasses, but it is statistically impossible what you're proposing, and I'll show you why. <clears throat> Mark 13.10, and the gospel must first be blank among the nations. we got to go out and tell everybody. And the gospel must first be did you say preached? Because now it says published. Mark 13, 10. Luke 17, 34. There shall be two men somewhere, and then there's two women doing something as well. What were the two women and the two men doing? The two men were in a field, and the two women were grinding grain? No. The two men are in the bed, and the two women are grinding. And I just was creating this, and my slide that you're looking at was copied from a PowerPoint I did about two years ago. And when I copied it over to this PowerPoint, it said two women will be grinding grain. And I thought, really? So I went and looked and sure enough, it's now just grinding. So that's an example of residual evidence. I have that slide that still said grain. It said two men but then in the grinding, it said grinding grain. Well, now they've grind, grinding grain is removed. It only says grinding, which, of course, is a euphemism for sex in Job. I think it's 32. So this is happening. And I've seen pastors come across this from the pulpit, and they were visibly shaken. And then they felt like they had to tell the congregation what it didn't mean. 
Oh, let me clear this up. It's not what it sounds like. All right, John 1, 41. He first findeth his own brother Simon and saith unto him, We found the... Talking about Jesus and his title that starts with an M. Did you say Messiah? Because your Bible now says we found the Messiahs. So if you said Messiah, you have to ask yourself, how did that get into my mind? Because it's never said that in any Bible, in any King James Bible in any century. It doesn't exist. John 3.16, do it from memory. God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth him, what? Did you say shall? Because now it says should. Genesis 28, 14, your descendants will be like the, this is God telling Abraham how blessed he was, and his descendants were going to be like, did you say the sand of the sea? The sands of the sea, or, and the nations of the earth? Because what it says now is the dust of the earth, your seed will be like the dust of the earth, and in thy seed shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Many people remember the nations of the earth and the sands of the sea. All right, so John 7, 1, After these things Jesus walked in Galilee, for he would not walk in Judea? No. It says that he, walk, he would not walk in Jewry. Jewry, of all the words I've ever read, that one I... Just have no comment on. Philippians 4, 6. Blank for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication. Make your request known unto God. Did you say be anxious for nothing? Because now it says be careful for nothing. Philippians 4, 6. Be anxious for nothing. No, no, sorry, it's not in there. 2 Corinthians 12, 10. For when I am weak, then... He is strong? Not only is that what most people remember, but it makes sense. What is in your Bible, though, doesn't make sense. For when I am weak, then I am strong. You can try to make it make sense, but let's be honest. It doesn't make sense, which is the problem. These changes introduce mind-bending nonsense that you are now forced to try to make sense out of. Exodus 12, 12, for blank will pass through the land of Egypt on that night and will strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt. I think this was in the biblical paradoxes once you probably know it, but most people remember the death angel, but that unfortunately has never existed. It now says, for I will pass through in Exodus 12, 12, and in 23, for the Lord will pass through. So God didn't send the death angel. But every pastor will say that, and I hear it all the time. The death angel has never existed in any Bible, in any century. You cannot find it. So how did it get into the minds of everybody? And again, if I ask 10 pastors, not just rank and file believers, 10 pastors, hey, pastor, who, who went in to kill the firstborn? Uh, the death angel. Wrong. Next pastor. Death angel, death angel, all 10 get it wrong. That is statistically impossible that they get it wrong the same way. You're going to have to re-examine the doctrine of preservation because God's proving your doctrine is wrong. Matthew 18, 20, for where two or blank are gathered together in my name, there I am in the midst. Two or what? Did you say more? Because that's what most people would say. However, it now says for where two or three are gathered. Exodus 26, 34, And thou shalt put the mercy seat upon the ark of the testimony in the... Where did the ark of the testimony go? Did you say the holy of holies? Because your word holy of holies does not exist in your King James Bible anywhere. Exodus 26, 34 calls it the most holy place. Hebrews 10, 19 calls it the holiest Hebrews 9, 7 calls it into the holiest of all. But nowhere will you find the term holy of holies in your King JV Bible. I used to sing a song as a worship leader about the holy of holies. So they got the song wrong. And I have all the references where it might have been in my book 
which is not there. James 1.25, But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the, did you say word? Because it actually now says work. That's James 1.25. John 8.32, And he shall know the truth, and ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall what? Let's just say it out loud. Set you free. Well, it now says make you free. Romans 8, 28. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are what? Did you say called according to his purpose? Because now it says the called according to his purpose. All right. All right. Well, you got through that quiz and that should have been illuminating to say the least. However, the real question that we have regarding the quiz is, did you get most of them wrong? What we want to point out is that why is it that most Christians get most of those wrong the same way? So what I'm about to show you is a man on the street that I did the quiz with. I'm going to show you he gets eight out of eight wrong. And the same way that he answers is the same way that you would probably answer and everybody else you talk to. Then I'm going to show you the math and how that is statistically impossible. It's not improbable, it's impossible. And just as a reminder, I am not in a hurry to deal with this topic. I believe it's the most important event of the church age next to Jesus coming on the scene. So this is a, obviously a very comprehensive treatment of this issue. So if this is just too long for you, you'll have to take it in chunks or just go away. I'm not apologizing for the length. So if you give that same quiz, that you can get on my website in the resources tab, go to wakeuporelse.com. If you give it to 100 people who read their King James Bible, most of them will get it wrong the same way, which I'm about to show is, it's not improbable, it's impossible. And once you're willing to admit that, that it's impossible, then you're forced to then ask the question, well, how can that happen? The only rationale that you have up until now is that it was simple, run-of-the-mill, everyday misremembering. But I'm going to be eliminating that. And then I will use the math to eliminate the idea that it's misremembering caused by misquotes from pop culture. We're going to use math to eliminate that as well. So, so what you're forced to then do is you have to admit that basically everybody has been exposed to a Bible that's different than the one that they have now, there's no other conclusion. Everybody's having the same memories. And that other Bible, the one that you think is out there, where everything you remember is in, it doesn't exist. It doesn't exist anywhere. So the only conclusion that you can draw is that the Bible has changed. So what I'm about to show, I believe, is absolute proof. And it took me seven years to finally get to this point. So let me show you <clears throat> this gentleman uh, on the street. I don't know him. I, I set up out there. I gave my book away for free if people would take a short Bible quiz. And I've got a bunch of these, but I only need to show you one because you can go and repeat it yourself. All right, so here we go. Here we are. I'm John, and you are... Sean. Sean, good to meet you, bud. Thanks for you. your time. So we did one question already, which was, judge not blank, you be judged. Could you fill in the blank like you did before? Yeah, I said list. List. Okay, the next one is Job chapter 1. This is where white Job's wife's haranguing him for, for not cursing God, right? Okay. And he says, the Lord blanks and the Lord blanks away. It's another King James one. The Lord blanks, and the oh, Lord oh. blanks away. Okay, the, the Lord gives, and the Lord takes away. Give me the King James version. Mm. Take your time. Oh, yeah, yes. Uh, the Lord giveth, and the Lord taketh away. Say it one more time. The Lord giveth, and the Lord taketh away. Okay. Moving right along. All right, now this one is a, a memory question. Remember when Noah was on the ark towards the end? And he sent the dove out to see if there was land. Mm -hmm. Okay, and the dove came back with something in its mouth. Do you remember? It was something in its mouth to indicate that they had, it had seen land. Yeah, uh, I'm guessing an olive branch, but that's... Olive branch. Is that what you said? 
That's that's what I yes, yeah, I'm going. Right. With. So this is just memory, and go with your gut. Go whatever comes first. It's a memory quiz. Go with your first impression. Don't overthink it, right? Yeah, yeah. No theological discussion. I'll give you the score at the end. All right, so this yeah. next one is Exodus 12. Remember when God judged Israel, or Asia, I mean, and he went in and, and killed the firstborn. Who went in to kill the firstborn? Peanut Gallery, by the uh, way, can, can chime in if you want. Oh, no, no. I, I'm off camera. Well, I don't want you to help me because I want to. Okay. I, I think it, I mean, it's the serious angel of death. Say it again. Angel of death. Okay. No, not it. That's okay. your, well, no, that's your answer. Yeah, that's my that's my answer. Yeah, there, yeah, yeah. There that's, is no right or wrong answer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, I, understand. I understand. That I understand. was and perfect. And I know that I'm going to have scored a zero because. So far, so good. That's You're doing what fine. we're setting up, but that's okay. I'm, You're I'm doing great. Along. You're doing great. All right, so now this is the millennial reign. It's in Isaiah. It's a very enigmatic passage. Most people remember this. It's talking about how there'll be peace in the millennial reign, and the blank shall lay down with the lamb. Oh, I assuming that would be the lion. Okay, moving right along. All right, now this one, Luke 6, 46. I'm going to read this one, and it should be familiar enough to you. And why call me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? Everyone that comes to me and hears my words and does them, I'll show you what he's like. He's like a man building a house who dug a great foundation upon the, what was the thing he built? A great foundation. The rock. Okay. Rock. And then a flood arose, and something beat against the house. What was that? What was beating against the house for the guy? The waters. I'm assuming the waters. I waters? Don't okay. Know no. that. You're fine. And then, but he, he that heareth and doeth not, like, is a man that built a foundation upon the sand. Okay. And... What beat against the house for that guy? Same thing? Yeah, yeah, water, yeah. Okay. All right, next question. Genesis 32, Jacob spends the whole night wrestling with somebody. He gets hit in the hip, remember that? Yeah. Okay, who did he wrestle with? Oh, he's, I, I, and I, my first... He's doing good, isn't he? My first <laughs> instinct is an angel... Um, Go with that. I don't know if it's uh, more specific than that, but I think it's an angel or angel of God. All right. I'll take that. Maybe right. it's God. Huh? Matthew eighteen twenty. This is a familiar passage. For where two or blank are gathered together in my name, there I am in the midst. For where two or blank are gathered together. Uh, believers. Oh, two or more. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Two, two or more. I guess I didn't listen very carefully. To You're that. good. No. Okay, I'm going to stop there. That's eight out of eight. <clears throat> now, I know there's people who are th trying to suggest that I paint this guy. He's a shill. But the problem that you have with that idea is if you were listening and answering the questions yourself, you were coming up with the same memories as he was. And you can go verify this yourself using my Bible quiz with any number of Christians and you'll get the exact same experience. So where are they getting that from? Here we are. So, I don't need to show the other 10 examples because it is repeatable to prove my assumption. You can do it yourself. So, based on that assumption that I can show 10 out of 10 people all misremembering the same simple Bible quiz questions the same way, I asked ChatGBT the following question. What is the probability of giving 10 different people a simple Bible quiz where each person has to answer 10 questions? As I said, I'm going to take my time. I'm going to tell you the whole question. We're going to go through this so there'll be no possible way to try to pick this apart. I mean, you can try, but I don't think you'll be able to. There are no multiple choice questions and no yes or no questions. They're all only filling in the blank questions that requires the person to come up with the answer on their own. Calculate the probability that each person would get all 10 questions wrong and that they would misremember them in the same way. So this was the response. To calculate the probability that 10 people will get all 10 questions wrong and misremember them in the exact same way, we need to make a few assumptions about the problem. Okay, now the first assumption is simply assigning P equals one means the math tells it 
everybody gets it wrong every question. That's all that means. Okay, the second one, though, is an attempt to quantify getting it wrong the same way. Now, the first time it did it, it had to make an assumption how many different possibilities are there. So for instance, if I ask somebody who laid down with the lamb, the number of possible responses is actually infinite. And when chat used that number, the response was it would be impossible. So what I did is I said, all right, let's just do it using 100 possible options to get a, a, a fixed number. So if I ask you who laid down with the lamb in this equation, there's only 100 possible answers. And there's the math. I'm not going to go through it all. It's really unnecessary for the purposes of what we're doing here because you can read it and you could do it yourself. Just take the question and put it on chat yourself. All right. And so it goes through to determine the final probability of 10 people all answering it wrong and all answering it wrong from their own memory in the same way. What it came up with was one in 10 to the 200th power. Now to give you an, a reference to that, a trillion would be 10 to the 12th power, a quadrillion is 10 to the 15th power, a quintillion is 10 to the 18th power. So this is 10 to the 200th power. The probability of 10 people misremembering all 10 questions exactly the same way is one in 10 followed by 200 zeros. It looks like that. It, uh, one with 100 zeros is called a Google. And so this would be one in two Google. <laughs> it's impossible. It's impossible. What I just showed you, a man on the street, you can do that too. And if you have 10 of those, it's impossible. So the entire body of Christ is responding to us, sounding the alarm, and they're just saying, oh, you're just misremembering. Well, I just proved that we're not just misremembering. I proved it. I defy any PhD statistician, any PhD theologian to disprove what I just presented. This seems to be irrefutable evidence that our testimony is true and the Bible is changing. The only way that someone could possibly argue against it is to suggest that all of the misremembering in unison is simply caused by misquotes from pop culture. So they're, they're going to try to suggest that basically all of humanity is befuddled and is operating with mid-level dementia and we can't remember our times tables. We don't remember our names. We're all bumping into walls and, you know, we're just getting bamboozled when we go to Facebook, we see a misquote and it just overwhelms all of the things that we're doing to the contrary, which I'm going to show you. So as shocked and embarrassed as I am from my brothers and sisters in the Lord that anyone would actually suggest this, I am forced to actually provide a serious response to this argument because it is so prevalent. I have seen this in most cases, it's sort of a last bastion of defense for even, I mean, the great minds of Christendom. I've watched them do this. Pastors of large churches, Bible school presidents have told me this. The position of the entire body of Christ on this topic is so weak that they are forced to respond with this ridiculous assumption because that's all they got. If I have a, a debate with a PhD in theology and a or senior pastor of a large church, this idea that we're about to explore together will be one of their arguments, a main argument. So it will certainly be a response to the evidence that 10 out of 10 Christians answering a Bible quiz are getting it the same way, that that's statistically impossible. They're going to suggest this. Well, they're just confused by misquotes from pop culture. Well, the argument... They will say that's not proof because they're just confused. So to address this argument, we will now apply the same laws of probabilities to that argument and see what we get. So here's the question that I pose to chat on, on this cockamamie idea. 
I want to calculate the probability of something. Here is the background. I will refer to those taking the other side of this debate as the unconvinced. Our testimony is that the observation that pastors will fail a simple Bible quiz based on 10 simple Bible questions from memory is proof that their Bible is supernaturally changing because they're content experts and they should know the answer to all those questions. However, the empirical evidence is that they fail these questions. Now, let me just pause here and mention what you just saw on the street with an average person, I do with pastors as well. I'll get the same response from pastors. I've done it with about 30 over the last seven years. Nothing's really changed. Now, a pilot would typically not fail 10 simple questions regarding their instrument panel. Everyone listening to me has the expectation that a doctor who's a content expert would not fail 10 simple anatomy questions. Uh, in a similar way, everyone's expectation is the KJV pastor should not fail 10 simple KJV-only Bible quiz questions, but they do. You can go do it yourself. Go to the KJV-only pastor and say, hey, pastor, judge not, blank ye be judged, and he'll tell you lest. He'll tell you, the Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. I watched them say it from the pulpit. I just saw last week pastor quoting the death angel from the pulpit, from his memory. Baptist pastor. The unconvinced, however, are trying to counter our evidence by suggesting that the pastors are simply confused by misquotes that they see in social media and pop culture. I want you to calculate the probability of a content expert, that is a pastor, being overwhelmed in his memory by misquotes from pop culture on 10 simple Bible quiz questions. In order to do this, you will need to make certain assumptions regarding where he's spending his time. You will also need to make certain assumptions regarding the possibility that when he is on social media or sees things in pop culture, he will actually come across a misquote that would be implanted in his memory and overcome all the other influences that would counteract that. Where is he looking on social media or entertainment will determine the likelihood of whether he will see any scriptures at all. So let's assume that he's, he sees one. Now, th let me just pause here. I can go on social media or YouTube for hours and never see one scripture. So you have to assume the misquote from pop culture theory has to assume that the pastors are going on social media at all. And if they go there, they do see a misquote, which then overwhelms their own Bible studies. And... That has to happen with not one passage, but 20 or 30. Think about that. That's what you're asking us to believe. So, but to be generous and to be extremely conservative, this is what I told Chat to do. Let's assume that, that he sees one misquote one time every day. And each day, he sees a different verse misquoted. So at the end of 30 days, he has been exposed to 30 different scriptures being misquoted. That is ridiculous, but we're going to go with it anyway. Okay, now it gets worse because we will need to develop two forms of assumptions. One will be the things that the pastor is paying attention to. And the second category is how much time he's giving attention to them. The first category will be things like surf surfing different social media channels like Facebook and YouTube and Twitter, as well as movies, entertainment, and official news outlets. The second category will be the disciplines of his faith, which will include the following. Are you ready? This is a content expert. It's a pastor preparing messages each week. Now, understand, all of these influences are happening on a regular basis, daily, weekly, monthly, yearly, over decades. I think aggregately it would be much, much more time than you would ever spend on social media. But what I've done is I've, I've so conservatively agreed that it's equal. You'll see. But each time the pastor is having these influences, this would be enforcing what the Bible has always said. So let's use Matthew 7, 1 as an example. Judge not that 
ye be not judged is what is in the King James. It's in the 1611. It's in every revision. It's in the 1769. It's in the King James on your table. It's on Grandma's Gutenberg. It's on every King James Bible, every shelf in every century. There is no King James Bible that doesn't say that. There is no King James Bible anywhere, dear soul, that says, judge not lest ye be judged. It doesn't exist. It's not a misprint or a rogue version that you got a hold of. What that means is every time he does one of these things, it should be enforcing, judge not that ye be not judged in his memory. But yet, when we ask them all, they always say, judge not lest ye be judged. So that's what you have to give an answer to. So he's preparing messages each week. He's conducting the service. He's conducting the midweek Bible study. He's visiting people and sharing the word. He's reading his Bible. He's studying his Bible, which is different. And the most important one, he's memorizing the Bible. He's reading Christian books and articles or blogs. He's reading his daily devotionals. He's listening to Christian messages, sermons, or materials. He's listening to Christian music. He's attending church services himself. I have been a pastor and I went to other places singing hymns and worship songs during services and attending Bible studies, or in his case, conducting them. So the next thing we need to do is estimate how much time the pastor is spending in these two categories. Of course, that will be great, vary greatly. And as I mentioned, I'm going to be very conservative. In this example, we will conservatively estimate that the pastor is spending one hour a day being exposed to social media, news entertainment, and one hour exposed to scripture and accurate scripture influences. Because the only other lame argument that is offered up is the pastors don't read their Bible anymore. Now, you have no proof of that. I don't believe you. And unless you can produce evidence, we reject that ridiculous assertion. It's not true. You're a liar, okay? What I'm producing is true and verifiable. So you will also need to weigh the influence by several factors. So in other words, the pastor is purposely committing the scripture to memory, but he's not trying to commit the misquotes from pop culture to memory. The pastor is, is accepting what the Bible is teaching him as the true word, whereas he may see a misquote on social media, but he will tend to reject it in his memory. For instance, if you saw some sinful behavior on social media being talked about as though it was now acceptable. Like, let's say you read about atheism. Do you suddenly become an atheist? How ridiculous is this? No. No, you're not somehow overwhelmed by this and have all these implanted thoughts because you glanced at it on social media. So because of that, uh, I asked chat to wait and initially chat GPT weighted it at like four to one. And, and so because I'm going to be super conservative, I said, let's just wait at two to one. So that means that the, the Bible influence will be twice as strong as the misquote from pop culture influence. And I believe that's very conservative, extremely conservative. All right. So let's use Matthew 7, 1, for example, which says, judge not lest you be judged. So if the pastor sees that quote on Facebook, he would generally recognize that as being incorrect and reject it in his mind. When he then sees it in his Bible as he's reading and he sees it again when he's studying, he sees it again in his daily devotional when he hears it in other messages, and especially when he commits it to memory, all those influences are going to be much more powerful to determine what his long-term memory is than at some passing glance on Facebook. You also have to calculate the probabilities of this happening with not just one, but 10 different scriptures or 20 or 30, which seem to be stored in the long term memory of all Christians and pastors. To accomplish this, I will concede that the pastor sees one different passage misquoted every day for 30 days. OK, so based on that, calculate how unlikely it is that misquotes from pop culture for 30 scriptures would overcome all the disciplines of the faith of a content expert like a pastor. Here it is. 
Let's break it down. Two to one weighting in favor of Bible influences compared to pop culture influences rather than four to one. So I brought it down more conservative. Okay, and then there's some assumptions. In this, in this calculation, the pastor is exposed to one misquote per day, each day being a different verse. Because remember, the guy on the street got eight out of eight wrong. I can do that with a pastor. So I'm just saying 30, but I think you understand. The pastor spends an equal amount of time on social media and in the spiritual disciplines, which I think is ridiculous. I mean, he's in church all day on Sunday, Bible studies, preparing for the studies. It's probably five to one how much time he's spending in the Word based, based on, he might not even go on social media. And if he goes on social media, there's no proof that he's seeing any of these things. It's just Hail Mary arguments. Anyway, like I said, I'm forced to respond to this. Spiritual disciplines are weighed more heavily, two to one, compared to pop culture, okay? So once the thing has that, then it goes into its calculation. And you can read that for yourself. I'm not going to take all the time, but here's the math. The probability of the pastor failing all 10 questions by recalling misquotes can be calculated using the following formula. All right, so the conclusion here ends up being, based on those extremely conservative estimates, it would be 1 in 59,049, basically 1 in 60,000. So you could figure it's, you know, 10 times that. So... Here's a recap of the probability projection. The two to one weighting ratio is very conservative. If I know that the Bible says the wolf lays down with the lamb as it always has, but I see the lion laying down with the lamb on Facebook, I'm going to reject the lion because I know the Bible says wolf. It's not going to penetrate my mind and go into long term memory without being resisted. So there has to be some level of weighting in favor. So we, we talked about that. The second assumption, which I think is very far from accurate, is the idea that I'm calculating the same amount of time spent on social media. So I already covered this, all right? Third variable, which is not even addressed, is the idea that these misquotes actually exist. I covered that. Okay, so it's one in 60,000. Oh, I can explain this. The pastor is just confused by misquotes from pop culture. At a minimum, that's a 1 in 60,000 chance with one. It's higher than that with multiple. So here's my conclusions to those two findings. We eliminated the objection of misremembering in question 11. We eliminated the objection of delusion in question 12. We further disproved the argument of ordinary misremembering by showing the probabilities that 10 people could misremember 10 quiz questions the same way. That completely obliterates the misremembering argument. We then eliminated the possibility that finding could be explained by misquotes from pop culture. We've now eliminated that as a possible reason. If all objections are removed, the only possible explanation left is our testimony unless you just want to pretend that we don't exist. Now, based on those observations, I'd like to point out the following. First of all, the legal definition of evidence includes a testimony. Evidence can take the form of testimony, documents, photographs, videos. That's from cornelllaw.edu. So testimonial evidence is evidence. Now, what is evidence? According to Oxford, Evidence is something that furnishes proof. Collins Dictionary. Evidence is one or more reasons for believing something. Dictionary.com. Evidence is anything that you see that causes you to believe something. So what I'm trying to say is our testimony meets the legal definition of evidence. And furthermore, evidence then is something that furnishes proof. One or more reasons for believing something is true anything that you see that causes you to believe that something is true. Our testimony is the evidence. Now, think hard with me, because we're almost done, but we're going to close the deal. 
You want to be so rational and try to suggest this is crazy talk and you're the rational one. All right, well, here's a giant can of rational for you. Would you agree that the testimonial evidence of an eyewitness in court cannot simply be dismissed because the defense attorney informs the judge he doesn't like the evidence? I've decided it should not be entered into the court, Your Honor. The judge is going to say, sit down. What are you talking about? You can't just dismiss our testimony because you don't like it. Secondly, would you agree that the testimonial evidence of an eyewitness in court cannot be stricken from the record due to an objection unless the judge determines that there is a valid reason for the objection and then he has to go on the record and agree with the objection by stating objection sustained. Would you agree with that? Last question. Would you agree that if a judge overrules an objection to someone's testimony, the result is that the testimony gets entered into the court as evidence? Would you agree with that? I think you would. I think a hundred reasonable men would. Now, here we go. Buckle your seatbelt. Because my question to the entire body of Christ is, do you have an alternate explanation for how 10 out of 10 people will misremember 10 simple Bible quiz questions incorrectly the same exact way every time in any country across all socioeconomic strata and cultural influences, the elderly and the young? What is your explanation, PhD in theology, Mr. Pastor, Mr intelligentsia would you agree that question 11 11 eliminated misremembering as an option certainly cast serious doubt on it would you agree that question 12 eliminated delusion oh you're just delusional well not if you answer questions 12 because if we're delusional so are you and i don't think you want to lump yourself in with us so you have to abandon the idea that we're delusional if you do not have an alternate explanation for these observations, then do you agree that you have no further objection to our testimony? Would you agree that if you cannot offer a rational objection to our testimony, then the only possible explanation that remains for this unchallenged empirical observation is our testimony? which would mean that the Bible is supernaturally changing. Let me read that again. Would you agree that if you can't offer a rational objection to our testimony, which is what? Our testimony is the Bible is supernaturally changing. That is, has been entered into the court of public opinion. And if there is no objection, it gets entered in and it becomes true and valid. So my question then is, if there's no objection, then that is the only possible explanation that remains. And therefore, would you agree, yes or no, that the Bible is supernaturally changing? Now, if you're going to fold your arms and you're going to say, no, I don't care what you say, the Bible can't change. Well, can you provide then a rational, a rational explanation as to why you believe that the unchallenged empirical evidence that points to the Bible being changed does not prove that it's being changed. Let me say that again. If you're going to just act like a six-year-old and stick your fingers in your ears and go, nah, 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 I can't hear you. That's what you're basically doing. You can't, you don't have an answer for us. What I want to know then is can you provide an explanation why you believe that our unchallenged evidence that indicates clearly that the Bible is changing doesn't prove that it's being changed? If you're unable to provide a rational explanation for why you continue to deny the unchallenged evidence that I've now given you, and you intend to maintain your public position that there's no evidence that the Bible's supernaturally changing, then I submit, with all due respect, that it will be you that is a charlatan and not those of us speaking on this topic. Because a charlatan, according to Merriam-Webster, 
is a person who falsely pretends to know something in order to deceive people. In this case, in your case, it will be you will have to pretend that you don't know something. You will be forced to pretend that you don't know what I just showed you. And you'll have to make up lies about us and call us charlatans. And then, worse than that, you'll have to defend the 34 biblical paradoxes as though it's the inspired word of God. It's taken me seven years to get to this point, to pri provide this level of certainty for you, this level of clarity that what we are saying has validity, and now it's irrefutable. And I, I, the only thing that I expect to get back is ad hominem attacks, because you have no rational answers for what I just presented. So my final question is, if all of what I just presented in, I don't know, four hours or something, if that doesn't convince you that the Bible is supernaturally changing, would there be anything that you would offer that would? What would convince you? So please send your answers to my email, which is wakeuporelse at proton.me. I'd love to hear rational answers on our questions. And then be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel, Wake Up or Else. Join the newsletter so you can be updated when we do live streams. And you can join our live streams. You can get my free books on my website at wakeuporelse.com, especially the Mandela Effect Supernatural Bible Change book and the Doctrine of the Preservation of Scripture. It's over 400 pages covering all the things that we talked about in this video. If you're... Um, Willing to testify that this is happening, please consider signing my affidavit. Just hit the affidavits tab. You'll read all about that. And then if you um, are in convinced that this is happening, please connect me with pastors and church leaders. Broker a call so I can talk to them. And uh, you can reach out to me at my email, wakeuporelse.com. Thank you for listening. I appreciate it and look forward to hearing back from you. God bless.